grab your sword, prepare your spells. It's time to become a legend of Omeria. All right, so I had to start over real quick. <laughs> um, I wanted to get my whole screen so you guys could see all the tools that I'm using. Uh, so thanks for bearing with me. All right, so in Photoshop, I've got the map. But really, this is what it looks like and how it started out. Um, Tim sizes his, or at least he used to size his maps weird. He and I had a, a conversation about it, so I think he's... He's going to be fixing it for now on. But this is the original map. Um, I have exclusive licensing to this, so I get the PSD, which makes it easier for me to do what I need to do. And when I've set it up for design, I've taken all the secret stuff. And he does a really awesome job of like layer organization. He puts all the numbers and stuff, which means I could just group it into one file and boop, uh, get rid of all of it. So all the secret doors and stuff like that are hidden. Um, I also turn on the black mode because I think it shows up a little bit better. So we just get rid of the white and the pattern overlay. And then um, I could turn off the grid. So this is, creates this. Then I put it into here. And what I've done is, so if you put like stark white on roll 20, it ends up being like really garish. So what I've done, you'll see is I go to my blending options. I hit option or I believe it's alt on a Mac or a PC. And I reduce the white in this layer. So it blends straight through. And I've put like, um, just a like a piece of parchment here, which is sized perfectly to it. So it just gives it kind of a little different theme. And it ends up looking like kind of a paper bag. But once it's in roll 20, it looks pretty cool. Um, I had to <clears throat> resize it a bit. Because you'll see in this, um, it's 24 by 58, which is not exactly clean. So typically what I've been doing is I will control A and then control shift C and get a whole image of this. This only matters if you're using like Tim's art. So, but I'm just kind of showing you the whole process. Um, I increase the canvas size by like about 500 pixels on each side. And then I actually came up with a formula for it. So his stuff's a little more narrow than it is tall. So if you increase it by 108.5% by 108.4, line it up to his um, to your grid in Photoshop. Let's make sure. Earlier I was having trouble with the lines. You can see the lines are a little bit off. And let's make a quick check to make sure that, that looks good. All right, let's slide it over just a bit more. Might be, am I off? Yeah, it looks like it's just a touch off. So we actually might need to make the height go a bit higher. Um, this can be kind of tedious if the map's not sized right, but um, you want it to be sized right so when characters are in your dungeon, they're moving around to where they should be. Uh, let's um, let's do this. We're gonna we turn. I turn the grid back on, so this will let me see how close we are to the original. And once we have our calculation, <clears throat> we should be able to get it right. All right, so let's see how close our grid is. Looks like, okay, so my original calculation's right. All right, that's good news. It's just the, uh, the walls are a little off. But if you look at the grid, the Photoshop grid with Tim's grid, they line up perfectly. Now he's fixed this issue in newer ones but if you end up licensing um like an older map from him like I, i'll go back and get some like these huge like multi-page maps um you might have to do some adjustments like this but you can see it's it's all right it's just the edge that's on his own doing so we'll just have to live with it um 
So since I know that my original calculation is right, uh, we'll, let's get rid of the grid again. Copy all this guy, paste it back into the document, size width 208.5. Now I, I'm, I've been using Photoshop for, uh, Oh God, since the late nineties. So you'll notice, I mean, I'll move through stuff pretty quick. So don't hesitate to ask me what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> um, cause yeah, like I'm just going to zoom through stuff and use a lot of hotkeys. Uh, let's move this guy up. some. I'm by no means a professional designer. I just Photoshop just happens to be a skill that I, I learned pretty early on in my, my days of internet career back back with AOL. All right, let's see how close we are here. Uh, we'll put that guy there. That looks good. That looks good. Height looks good. Width looks like it's pretty. Any funkiness. All right, there we go. We'll use this hallway over here. That'll tell us. Okay. So I think that's going to be good. That's going to be good. And like I said, we're going to use um, this paper layer to kind of give it a cool effect. We'll put that underneath. Make sure it's in the right spot. And then we're going to adjust the white layer underneath. So this is an easy way to get rid of white. Just go to your blending options and do that, and you're good. And finally, we will crop out there's also a really narrow line on each of his so we got to get rid of that too so just go <clears throat> edit or image crop oh there we go perfect map this should line up to like uh, i think it's like with 2660 height 29 or 3290 and go Two six six zero three two nine zero. So we are in good shape. I've already gone through and saved one like that, but I just kind of wanted to show you how it's doing it in Photoshop. Um, supposedly, for cleaner um, maps, it's best to cut them in the fourths. So let's go ahead and do that now. Um, if you're going to have a really big map, you want it to be nice and um, clean for folks and do it right on the grid line makes it easier. So we'll divide it into twos. My width is three, two, two, or excuse me, two, six, six, zero. So that's a hundred and you can just set in our fixed size marquee and then three, two, nine, zero divided by two is going to be 1645. All right. So there we go. Cut this guy out. This will be part one. Okay. So see how I've, um, uh, should there be overlap? Let's make it, let's make our life easier and do a little bit of overlap. So twenty divided twenty times seventy is all right, and do sixteen ninety. So we're gonna have a little bit of overlap, but that's okay. Ah, uh, bloody hell. <laughs> you know what? Instead of dealing with Photoshop, let's just go straight to it. <laughs> hey, look, it's already loaded up. Wow, it's amazing. Technology. Um, all right, so kind of to recap what I was working on. <clears throat> I ended up putting the image in here. Um, I've got it set up 38 by 47 units or 2660 by 3290. Um, the grid color I've turned black because if you do the gray, it doesn't show up against the background. And I've also adjusted the cell width 
to 0 0.5. I've turned on my dynamic lighting and enforced line of sight, and then I've restricted movement, okay? So this is the basic setup for what we're gonna have. Um, right now, it's just basically a blank canvas. Um, we've got the original map in here. So let's go to the map because I want to put in the numbers and I'm going to do it the same way that Tim did it. Um, Tim's usually pretty good about logically placing numbers based on where they're most likely to enter the dungeon. And then he goes, I believe, clockwise from there. So the, the old school follow the wall rule. <clears throat> so we can see here, like this is sort of the front of the dungeon where this tree line is. And then there is a, a ramp that goes up the down. This line means that it's descending downward and you're not going to be able to see that in the, um, in the final version. Um, this is the entrance. He's got a little pit trap here. It looks like some sort of portcullis um, down here. Another pit trap stairs goes up into this main layer here. Uh, and then the way he's got it numbered is uh, kind of going this way. So not exactly clockwise, but it looks like he's filling out this room first, filling out the back of the dungeon. There's a staircase down, which will lead us to our other part of the dungeon later. Uh, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. So going counterclockwise in this situation. All the way to 31 is where it ends. It's pretty cool. Um, and what we'll do is we'll go in and start numbering it the same way up in our roll 20 version uh you don't you can get fancy with this and you can throw in a bunch of um um like little little tokens that have it but i figure for this exercise what i want to do is just make it as simple as possible so let's just go to our text editor um and we'll just start typing the numbers in make sure they're big enough that you can read from a distance so i'm going to make it 56 uh, maybe a little bit smaller than that Let's make it a one and then just once you're done typing hit escape oh maybe that's not big enough <laughs> all right so we'll make it 100 escape and then we can move this around wherever we need to it's going to adhere to the grid right away but if you hit your option button while moving stuff around you can place it any way you want same works too with like if you're going to rotate it or whatnot and then if you don't just if you want it to conform to the grid, just release your option button. You can see it'll snap to like a nice 45 degree angle. But I think one right there is good. And we are just going to go through and do the same numbering that he has on his. So one, two, it's going to be this ramp. Uh, two. I'm just going to kind of sloppy place them in and then move them around once I'm done. So here's 3A. Uh, geez. 3B. Uh, what's he got next? 4A, 4B. You could probably get rid of the... Might be a little redundant to have the 3. For A, B, what's next? Five and six of these secret layers. So five. If you need to move your screen, um, I've got it set up so my scroll wheel zooms in, and then um, I can pan. Whoops. Looks like I've moved the whole map over somehow. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, let's get these back where they're supposed to go. Now I've lost my, my numbers. <laughs> Such is the way of design and roll 20. Here's one. Oh, another B. Here's something hiding over here. It's 4A. There's my original three. Okay, we're back in business. <laughs> um, 
Oh crap, I gotta move it up too, Donner. All right, stay. Don't you move. All right, five was here. It's here. It's here. All right, so this will be our six. Uh, seven is going to be the top of this landing. I think eight is this main hall. Yeah, that's eight A. Looks like eight A, B, C, D, and E. So we'll continue that motif. B. C's on the fountain. Uh, D, I think, was the landing on the spiral staircase. E finally was right here. Let's double check. Yep, looks like there's another pit trap over there. So we're going to go in and put in these pit traps later on using our GM layer because you don't want your um, you don't want your players to see those. Obviously, that way you can catch them by surprise. All right, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So we're going to go in here. Go nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, whoops. And if you're like me, I'm constantly hitting the wrong hotkeys. I get my Photoshop hotkeys mixed up with Roll20 all the time. Um, 14, 15, 16. Uh, 17, 18, 19's that secret room. So 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. How are we doing? Good so far. 23 is A. So let's not forget that. 23A, B. Uh, I think this is 24. Yep, looks like it's got. So the way Tim likes to do it is if there's multiple areas of interest, especially when you're in a large map like this where they're not necessarily going to be able to see all sides of the room at once. So like take A, for example, you've got, um, they're probably... 90% of the time, they're going to enter through this set of double doors here, right? And with even 120 feet of long range, they're only going to be able to see, like, like even a drow is like, that's the maximum edge of his vision. So they're not going to see this fountain. They're not going to see this over here. They're not going to see here. They're not going to see any of this crap. Um, so it's important to kind of break some of that stuff up. Uh, another cool theme is um, that you'll see, in, especially in his book, um, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, where he designed all the maps in there, is he'll, the different ecologies and sections of the dungeon itself will have their own number scheme. Um, so, like, if a whole bunch of goblins lived, like, in this area, like, say, that just this big chunk right here, the goblins would, it would be, like, 9A, 9B, 9C, 9D, 9E, and then it would be called, like, nine, section 9 would be goblin layers, and all the individual rooms would be part of that. Um, I'm not going to get that complicated with this. I just kind of want to go with what he has. And I want to make this um, dungeon as simple as possible to kind of give you an idea of, like, you know, kind of the basics in numbering. Remember, like, numbering is all about logical placement and where the... Um, the characters most likely are because when you are, are writing <clears throat> either for yourself or for the DM, 
you want to make sure that um, it's easy to read. So you don't want them flipping through a bunch of pages. So if it's, you know, if you look through here, like likely they're going to interrupt the ramp. So they're going to go one to two to three to four to, to uh, five. Um, I don't know that I would number six there, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to trust him on this. He's been in the game a lot longer than me. <laughs> uh, seven to eight to nine you know what i mean it's going to be very like sequential uh numbering style again i don't know that i would put 11 right there because i think characters the players are going to go through here and then through this door and then through this door and double back but that's when it gets complicated you have to do a little bit of jumping around like it's a choose your own adventure book uh let's see so back to numbering 25, um, 26, 27, I think this is 28. All right, so where are we so far? A lot of times you'll see that um, map makers don't number corridors, so you can see this corridor is unnumbered. Um, so generally, the, the general features of it will reflect what is in that corridor. Uh, I did 28, right? Okay, cool. 29. I think this one's 30. And then finally, 31. Let's make sure. Oh, we got an A and a B. B. A. All right, cool. So we've got all of our numbers in place. And then really, from there, we'd want to clean it up just by making it, you know, getting everything so it's nice, clean, easy to read for yourself or whoever's going to, oh, for the love of God. Roll, roll 20 is not without its fun bugs. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing product. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. I love it. But gee whiz. Sometimes it's like kind of mind of its own. So I'm just adjusting these the best I can. There's no kind of like, um, in Photoshop, you've got tools that can make everything kind of snap into place and align. Don't have that here, so you're just going to have to eyeball it. It's fine. Your your players are never going to, in theory, should never see these numbers. So you're only the one who has to live with <laughs> how organized you make your GM layer. Because remember, this is on the GM layer, which means, I mean, this is what the players see. They're not going to see any of these numbers here. It's just going to be on the GM layer, which is this eyeball tool. Um, so pretty, yeah, but this is just for my own OCD and sanity. I want to get everything as neat and organized as I possibly can. Also, I mean, I might move stuff around later. Like if I put monsters in and stuff, I might move these down. I might shrink them a little. Right now, we're just trying to make it legible so we've got a nice backdrop with which to start our dungeon so yeah um you know interestingly i i started with second edition and um well right when second edition was starting technically i started with uh basic and i got the uh black box which was the new easy to master dungeons and dragons um game Came with some cool Larry Elmore art on the front. Big red dragon. And I've always been a, a fan of the classic dungeon crawl. Like, it was the maps that always kind of pulled me in. I thought they were really neat and, like, imagining what could be in them. And that's kind of led to my love of um, stocking dungeons. And there's just something kind of, like, I don't know, meditative about going through and putting in numbers and making sure everything's nice and neat. I, I mean, I drew maps, but it... Like, I have more fun looking at someone else's work because, you know, if, when I draw maps, I get a little self-conscious, weirdly. Because I'm like, oh, does this make sense? And, you know, I'll go back and do it. I mean, I guess if I practice a lot, it'd be one thing. But um, it's more fun when I see, like, something like Tim's done like this, where it's this, like, amazing five-part dungeon that's, um, you know, got just this section has, like, 31 rooms. So I'm probably looking at, you know, like 160 to 180 different rooms with which to stock and um kind of coming up with the story based on his art okay so 
we've got all the numbers down. Next, we want to put in the secret stuff. And this, we, we got a little cheat sheet with this. Like, he's got the wells and open pits. Um, but most of the hidden stuff that we don't want players to see, he keeps towards the top of his stuff. So we can see there's secret doors, covered pit trap, and a downward slope area. Um, I'm going to just kind of make these by hand. And um, in here, I don't want to go crazy and like import anything, it, you know, just not with this like kind of presentation. So let's get his pit traps in there. Uh, first of all, we see that there's one here, one here, one here. And I think it's just the three. So we're going to put those in. Pit traps are always fun. They're classic. Um, they kind of like, I mean, they're kind of like a gotcha with DMs more like you don't want them ever to be too crazy because generally a pit trap doesn't have a save it's more about how fast your characters are going to be going into the dungeon so if they're being like you know if they're just rushing through and what i've done here in case you didn't see is first i drew a box using my shape tool and then i'm just drawing polygons to or the polygon draw tool. It's not perfect, but like, I mean, again, you're gonna be the only one who sees this. You might reveal it later for um, the characters. And if you did, just like highlight it with your built-in marquee. Oops, try not to get the number there. Highlight it with built-in marquee, and then you can just switch it to your token layer. That way when they find it and, you know, they fall in and are cussing you out, <laughs> Scotsman. <laughs> they uh um know what's going on. Plus what's cool is like let's not make life difficult. Let's just copy this and throw it back in there and when we'll just highlight it again. Oop. Get away B. Nobody nobody wants you over here. All right. This is between me and the pit trap. Chill out. Oh my gosh. Stop. Just stay over there. Stay. Oh my god. Just, what is going on here? Just get out of the way, B. I almost thought for a second there was gonna highlight that B again. <laughs> super super sensitive uh animation, I guess. I think that's right where that one goes. Yeah. So this is kind of cool. So some design basics. Um there's probably a good chance they're gonna fall on this one. And they're going to learn their lesson. And then they're going to see this pinch in the archway again. And they're going to go, okay, we're going to check for traps. <laughs> and right, like stuff like this is cool. Not because, you know, it's like a, ha ha, I got you. But in basic dungeon design, it establishes um, the rules for the dungeon. You're telling your players that I'm not, you know, you better be careful coming in here. Because if you're not, I'm going to throw you into... <laughs> I'm going to throw you into the dungeon or I'm going to throw you into a pit Scotsman and <laughs> uh, you better start searching for the rest of the time. So this happened the other night in my regular dungeon, the mad mage game that I run every night. It's kind of like a living, like a ongoing MMORPG except run by me. And uh, they're just like strutting through this tough level. And well, they fell into a pit trap. And guess what? They were searching after that. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, pit traps are good to like, like they're like nice little wake up calls for, for players who, who stop focusing. And you'll find when you play games with me, there's a lot of little things that I'll do to um, keep them on their toes. I think pr probably the one that my players are most familiar with are how I do Umber Hulks. Like, if you do not say that you avert your eyes at the start of your turn, you will get a confusion roll. And most people will remember, like, the first few times, but then they get excited and they'll forget. And I'll be like, ah, you didn't say it. Make a Christmas safe. They get all mad. Oh, oh, well, my character. I was like, I don't care what your character would have done. <laughs> you jumped the ball. So now you're going to make a Christmas save. And look at that. You're hopping in place because you stared at a number Hulk in the eyes. Magnus. <laughs> All right, so there's our pit traps. We got one, two, three pit traps. Looking good. 
let's throw in our secret doors again. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel for this. I'm just going to take my text tool and let's see where ours are. We got ones between five and six here. So let's plug those in. I'm just going to take my text tool again. Uh, make this super easy to do. Type an S, capital S. I'm going to turn it white. So it shows up. And then it'll be a little bit faded out. That's okay. You should still be able to see it pretty well. Copy this bad boy and just plug it in where it needs to go. Uh, I'm sure there's some more up here. Let's see. Yep, there's another one right there. Uh, oh, there's another one right there. All right, I think it's just the four. So I can turn my layer on and off, and whatever catches out of my eye, I'll be able to see it. Um, so we're going to go back up here. I'm going to plug in this guy. Secret doors are kind of interesting. Like, um, if it's shortcut, you don't have to make it obvious to find. And if it's... So here, here's how you should think about secret doors. Like, if it is vital to the story that they find it, you want to have some sort of signaling that it's going on. Like, you want to say something like... Like, remember the Goonies when they dropped the, um, the water cooler and the water runs underneath and you could hear it, like, dripping? Like, that was kind of, like, an obvious. So you really want to telegraph that there's a secret door there. But when it's something like an extra reward, like something out of, like, a Zelda game, you know, there's, like, a hidden treasure or, or something that they that the game doesn't depend on them finding, then you can make it harder to find. Um, sometimes it's going to just be super obvious that there's a secret door. So, like, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, again... To get down to level two, you have to find a secret door. And the spoilers for people who haven't done it. Um, the characters have to find a secret door, or uh, two secret doors, actually, that lead to the area which goes down. It It's unlikely that they're ever going to find it because you're dealing with um, 35 to 40 layers, uh, rooms, in that first map. And um, they're, they're not going to search every single inch of wall for it. I mean, they might. Uh, it'll drive you crazy, but they might. But more or less, they're probably going to move on and go do something else. But there's an NPC who knows where they are. And he's like, aha, there's secret doors here. And it leads downstairs. And then that's um, that kind of leads you to it. But then there's other secret doors in there which aren't necessary to find. And yeah, I mean... Spoilers, guys, you guys missed like an entire section of the dungeon because it's just hidden. <laughs> Too bad you can't go back to the first level and look for it now. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, secret doors, that's pretty much the way you should think about it. Like if they if they need it to finish the, the adventure and the plot, then you need to make it obvious to find. Otherwise, um, give some sort of hint that it exists. Um, like even if it means just a basic search around the room. Um Hang on, guys. My dog wants outside. So anyways, that's Secret Doors in a nutshell. Okay, I think there was one. Oh, the downslope arrow. Uh, I'm not going to put that in right now. I might come back later and, and put it in Photoshop and <clears throat> plug it in there. But for now, I don't think it's super necessary. But here we go. We got our dungeon loaded in. Got all of our numbers. Um, you know, we, we got it kind of a basic layout. Let's, um, start doing dynamic lighting, uh, for it. So dynamic lighting is, is definitely going to be a big part of your, your roll 20 games. And I think it's where roll 20 really shines and makes it better than a table game. It, it really makes it a whole different game altogether. Um, DMing for a virtual game, has in itself a whole different skill set than what you've got in a um like a traditional tabletop game because it's like things like dark vision um I, I mean i hate to say it they don't it doesn't really matter in a tabletop game it's tedious it's like dealing with encumbrance you know stuff like that is is hard to keep track of and you're just kind of let things slide 
But when you're dealing with people playing like humans who can't see in the dark, they got to light a torch. And if they get a torch lit, that means monsters can see them. And you can see on the map who can see and who can do what. And same thing with like people with rain, uh, dark vision of 120 feet. They have a decided advantage over people who have only got dark vision of 60 feet and so on and so forth. So dark vision or dynamic lighting in the game is really, really important. And as long as you and your players have the browser capabilities to do it, I highly recommend turning it on. Um, they're working on a new system right now for it. And I've heard it's pretty cool and I've tested it out, but I, I use the old one. All I do is turn on dynamic lighting, enforced line of sight. Um, and then I leave the update on drop off but and if it's like an outside area i'll turn on global illumination but even then sometimes i'll just use i'll keep global illumination off and make fake daylight outside which is probably what i'm going to end up doing with this because you can see this whole section here has um is like an outside so unless they're coming in at night i think it's a lot cooler just to leave that lit up all right so we are going to put in some dynamic lighting um i don't do it I mean, I'm not a pro at this. I've got people who build up my Roll20 stuff, but when I put in my own dynamic lighting, I make it, I make it pretty simple. And I'll go to my polygon tool, and I just start drawing edges. And it's pretty simple. You just do, just kind of follow the edge. Actually, I'm gonna get a little bit closer. Uh, you want to try to get within. Let me start over. Um, you see that there's the different squares and the big the important thing is you want to try to you don't want to like totally get it on the edge because you want it, the players to be able to see that there's a wall there but you don't want it to be too far either because otherwise they'll be able to walk into the wall and it looks weird so in like a nice striking a nice balance between the two is pretty good um straight edges and when you're done just right click and it automatically saves it for you I'm going to come back to do the straight edges later and I'll show you kind of like the little hack that I use to do that. But let's do the uh, the rough, the, the cavern edges first because those don't have to be perfect. They can be kind of chunky so long as they conform roughly to the walls in which you're, um, we have on the outside of our dungeon. The rest of our dungeon is going to be um, uh, uh, mostly nice straight edges. Um, which are which can be pretty easy to do, and I'll I'll kind of show you my method for that. All right, so uh, circles are a little bit tougher because there's really um, unless somebody knows a way that I don't, there's not a really good way to make a um, semicircle like that. Uh, it's not like uh, the pin tool that you have in Photoshop where you can like click the points and like stretch it. So the best way to do this is just to do it. It's it's tedious, but if you wanted to get like look kind of good without looking real hanky because keep in mind your players are going to be able to see these edges once they're lit up um just kind of draw them one grid at a time just make you know take a second every few seconds to go back and look judging by the pro designs that like watsy's putting up it looks like they kind of follow a same um mo you just slowly go across it until you can get through this whole edge yeah it's a pain in the butt but Hey, anything worth doing, it's worth doing right. <laughs> um, so when making a dungeon, there's going to be lots of stuff you want to try to think about. Now, the old school way of most dungeons is that generally the monsters that are living in a dungeon aren't the first people to live in. I mean, yeah, you might have some like fortresses that were built specifically for them but the old school way is like the building served some old purpose like it was a dwarven fortress or it was a borderlands keep or it was like um like a training academy for fighters or something and then in the last few decades maybe even centuries um someone's come into the ruins and called it their own and when you do that kind of story, what it does is it's going to open up a lot of like, you can, and you can control Z when you make little mistakes. I'm probably being way pickier than I need to be. But what what it does when you kind of go with that, 
that idea of what the place used to be and what it was originally intended for is that it makes it possible to insert all kinds of interesting things. So if you if you make one dungeon that's nothing but one type of monster, it's going to get kind of tedious. Like if you go in and it's nothing but freaking goblins and not even like variants, just like goblin, it's a goblin, right? That's not a lot of fun. You know, even Super Mario has Goombas and um, <laughs> the, the little turtles and then like plants who just happen to like be around and, you know, like all these different types of monsters because it breaks it up because there's different ecologies working in the same world. And that philosophy goes well. And then when you have an old dungeon that, for whatever reason, was empty for X number of years and now is once again being resettled, you can fill it with all kinds of interesting stuff that's um, beyond just the basic theme. So even if goblins did settle in this, there might be a section of the dungeon that they haven't explored yet, or they um, they might be contesting it with like, there might be like a gang of gnolls on one side that is contesting the dungeon, or I'm just double checking it. Um, something, you know, similar to that. So, um, yeah, that's why I like going with the old, like, oh, what's in this dungeon? What is it now? Kind of story. I think it just makes for better storytelling. All right, so we got the rough outline here. Let me show you how to make, um, we're going to go ahead and set up some outside lights real quick. Because like I said, we've got uh, this big area out here. We want to make it daylight. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I'm, I'm no adventuring hero, but I don't know that I would specifically want to go <laughs> to a creepy place in the middle of the daytime or in the middle of the night. That seems like a bad idea. Let's go in the daytime. So if we have to run away, be okay. So, right. So what I'm doing is on my object and token layer, I've got these little light sources, which is nothing more than just a little yellow because these things are going to be invisible anyways. This is going to be duplicating the effects of sunlight. Um, to do that, you have to first put it on your token layer. Go to your little cog wheel here. And let's give it, we'll give it like, gosh, uh, like 100 feet of light and dim light starts at 80. All players can see light. It doesn't have to have sight. And you can see right away, <clears throat> it's lit things up. And let me get a um, token too. We're going to have, I used to use a drow just because dark vision. But we're going to use a drow to like be our scout. And <coughs> see stuff. So on your token layer, if you hit command L, or um, I think it's a control L on a PC, you can see already like our dynamic lighting is starting to work because I can't move through it because I've got the restricted movement on. Yeah, he can move a little bit into the wall, but nothing crazy. Um, and then we're just going to cut. And then the next thing we want to do is we don't want this little yellow ball hanging out. And unfortunately, you can't put tokens into your dynamic lighting layer. So the trick that I use, as well as like all the other designers do, is just like copy this guy, go to dynamic lighting, and then just paste it back right where it was. And then go back to your objects and tokens layer, delete it, and you can see, boom, permanently we've got our light source for dynamic lighting, which when you look at the tokens layer, it's it's invisible. And our our PC here, he can't even see it, but it's there. All right, so we've got our dynamic lighting. Um, I'm gonna post this a few more times so it's putting out plenty of light all throughout the outside of our dungeon. And you could put dim light if you wanted, like it being like uh, nighttime or whatever. Here, we'll put one right in front of there. Cool. Move these there. All right, so look, we've got the whole front lit up. Let's use our dude to see how it looks. Oh, what's this big crazy place? <laughs> that's, that's actually a voice I use. You can see it's blocking line of sight here. So as I'm getting closer, I'm like, oh, wow, this is great. Wow, look at this dungeon. This is so great. That's how I'll draw. It's not in my campaign, by the way. Oh, yeah, you know, you thought they would be cool reading all those Robert Salvatore novels, but no, they're a bunch of big dorks. 
wow, this place is scary. I, said, ah, I fell in a pit trap. And as you can see, I haven't put the lines everywhere else, so he can just fly through walls. Get back out of there, Drow Man. I gotta put in some more stuff. And remember, too, he's not gonna see our our overlay. So this is really what the character is gonna end up seeing. Like, oh, what's this? Oh, I fell in a pit trap again. I just can't seem to learn to carry a ten foot pole. Darn me. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're gonna continue our dynamic lighting and. I will wax poetic about some other stuff you should know. So I haven't really come up with any story for this, but um, in my campaign world of Amiria, um, there's a section of the world called um, the Summerland. And the Summerland is sort of like the oldest human settlement where, um, you know, it's your typical medieval style flavor but i've thrown in like a little bit like a little bit of arabic myth there's lots of different princes and stuff like that just like there are in, in modern saudi and uh, uae and a few other things but there used to be a bunch of dragons there and they scared them all off so now you've got these big empty dungeons that used to be owned by dragons that's kind of what i was hoping for this one too all right so i'm gonna go for i'm gonna put in some straight lines now because it looks like with the exception of a few doodads it's going to be mostly straight lines and here is the way that i like to do it it's kind of a lazy hacky way to do it but it will save you some time and misery just take your box tool and boop put it right there and just get them all lined up again you want to leave a slight margin you can see there's a little gap here, so let's fill that gap real quick before we forget about it. There we go. And see now, like even though it's a box, when um, I need to give our drow a name, we'll call him Derek. So when Derek the drow, see, he he can't he doesn't know any better. He just knows he's gonna fall in the pit trap again. Oh my gosh, Derek, get at, come on, man, carry a ten foot pole. Make a perception check, bro. And that's it. Um, that's all you really got to do with that. You can't... I mean, you, I guess you could do that with the diagonals, but it's, you know... I mean, some things are okay to draw by hand. But for the most part, I'm going to do that with the majority. And I use blue. That seems to be the... Um, by the way, you'll see that I'm using blue. The popular method seems to use the complementary colors blue for the walls. And then orange for doors that could be deleted. So uh, here we go with this. Remember, too, that we can we can move this bad boy and try to get it near as many straight lines as you can. And it's okay to do more than one. Just make sure like they're all lined up. And look, you can also like squish them. This is why using the box tool, it's not it like it's not as sexy. And I don't know. I don't think the pro guys on uh, guys and gals and binary pals on um, roll twenty who do these maps um, necessarily use this map method. But for me, I find it pretty effective. And golly, is a time saver. So we're just going to keep on doing that um, and just keep moving it around so it's nice and even. All right, so while I'm working on that, let me see what what questions people have. Make a sniff check. <laughs> Rewind about five minutes. Light token. Yeah, so John, what I did was I created a token in... I'll show you again here real quick. So you can see this is my dynamic lighting layer. And what I did was um, in my objects and tokens layer, I've got this right here, right? I set up my dynamic lighting there first, so it emits light 100 feet and 80. Make sure that all players can see light. Copy it while you're still on your token layer. Switch to your dynamic lighting layer, and then paste it into the dynamic lighting. Go back to objects of tokens, get rid of the original one, and boom, now it's in your dynamic lighting. That's all it is. It took me a minute to figure out how to do it, but um, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's something that's been requested, dynamic lighting 
doesn't give you a lot of the same options. Like it doesn't give you your freehand tool. So a lot of times you have to kind of like break the system around. Right so if like if I wanted to draw freehand too, I'd have to turn on my freehand tool while I'm in my token layer and then switch to dynamic lighting. And oh, look, now I got my freehand tool. And you can see it does that. So little little hacks like that are how to get around some of the system. I mean, Roll Twenty's got a lot on their hands, so I don't blame them for not adding all these things in yet. But I imagine in the future you'll probably be able to see these as um, like things that people will be able to do. So I hope that helps out. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Cool. Yeah, if anybody has any more questions, just let me know and I'll try to get to them regularly. Um, so I'm going to be doing this, but I'm chat a little bit more about some of my ideas and thoughts for just DMing and dungeon design in general, unless you want to like watch me edit these. And one of these days I'll figure out how to use OBS and <laughs> like uh, put on some music. Right now I'm listening to tunes by my pal Michael Gelfi. Um, he's got a Patreon. I'm going to be using more of his music. Uh, I really like it. He's got like a lot of cool ambiances, ambiance that uh, just really kind of like in my mind, it fits the tone. It's not too like music can be a little distracting, but I like a nice ambiance because it gives freaky situation. Anybody who's played in my games can probably tell you about like when I use the existential dread to make Scotsman cuss and call me dirty names that I, I'm not British enough to repeat on here. Um, if anyone's ever interested in playing any of my games, all patrons of the Platinum tier get access to my Legendary Lounge. And in the Legendary Lounge, we do nightly games in the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which I think we've gone, I think it's almost up to a month now with the number of games that we've done which is pretty, pretty cool. It's just a couple hours each night, 9.30 Central Time to <clears throat> um, about 11.30, longer if we're in a combat or, you know, it's like a weekend or something. But uh, it's been a lot of fun. They've um, carved out a nice little section of the dungeon for themselves. And um, the stories really evolve. Some of the NPCs are out to get them, some they're friends with. Um, yeah, it's come. It's become like its own like little TV show with, and because it's West March's style, it's a different group each night, and everybody gets to roll off to see. Um, I'll probably do it so Platinum patrons will get like automatic passes once a month based on, you know, so like you always get in. First one's free, <laughs> um, but like if you can't always make it and you have like one night to play, I'll probably set it up so you automatically get in, which would be kind of nice. But anyways, yeah, it's a lot of fun. We, uh, um, we've done it. The maps that I'm using here, it's the same designer as who did Dungeon of the Mad Mage. So um, if you don't know the history of Dungeon of the Mad Mage, it's one of the older uh, Dungeons & Dragons modules, uh, Under Mountain. It's about, uh, most people know the city named Waterdeep, but Waterdeep is actually built over top of a giant dungeon that used to be a dwarven stronghold. <clears throat> and yeah, like, um, and the, the tavern, the Yawning Portal, has the most well-known entrance into the dungeon, which goes straight down into the first level. A evil mage named Halister rolls it. None of this is spoilers. I mean, this is all basic stuff. That's why it's called Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Because um, old Halister is the uh, the ultimate lord of, of Undermountain. And the original hook was just, hey, go down there and find some magic items and stab some things. <laughs> and now, now it's more about how do we get out of here? Because they're trapped a few levels down. They've been forbidden to go back up by the Zin or the Zinterim uh, due to a, uh, a an alliance that the Zinterim have with House Avendar, who are these drow bad guys who live in the dungeon. 
because the characters went into Hal Savandar's stuff, and well, it's not totally their fault. The he picked a fight with some Quagoths <clears throat> and end up killing a bunch of them. And well, Hal Savandar's not dealing it. And then the second time they went into Hal Savandar's um, lair on the second level, and uh, yeah, that didn't turn out so good. <laughs> Ended up in another fight, a bigger fight, and then they got chased off the level. Um, so it was a hectic couple weeks for my Undermountain Dwellers. But now they've got their own little fortress. they got some other issues they got to deal with, but I think they'll be okay. I mean, I don't know. I don't plan this shit. <laughs> All right, so if you're just tuning in, I'm just setting up dynamic lighting in this brand new map. I've already... Uploaded the map, put in all the numbers for it, um, and now I'm just doing dynamic lighting. I set up the lights outside. Um, I'm setting up the walls now, which I'm using with a the square tool, which I think makes nice and neat lines. It's easier to adjust if you make a mistake like I did here. See? Bloop. And yeah, it's just um, it's like definitely the easiest way to do it. Otherwise, if you're drawing with the polygon tool, you're gonna end up going insane. And I don't want you to go insane. I love all of you too much. All right, so one thing I'm gonna go back and do is see I've got this big fat ugly margin here, and I don't like that. So I'm gonna go back with my polygon tool and make a second layer, um, because it's a nice big thick wall, and um. I kind of wanted to, you know, I, I want them to still see a little bit of the layer, but I don't want them to, like, see the whole deal. And I want to give it, like, like you know, at least the illusion that it's, like, a big, thick fortress walls. You know, these are all five feet thick, so these are huge stone blocks. Um, a lot of times when you're making dungeons, you need to be cognizant of the type of building materials that were traditionally used. Um, which sounds weird. I mean, you kind of, as a DM, you're going to have to become an expert on a lot of random ass subjects. Uh, limestone and granite were probably the two most popular. I think granite was probably the most popular from medieval, whereas limestone tends to be more of your um, your old world uh, or like ancient world building materials like the pyramids, I believe, were made of limestone. Some other weird things that you should know is like how heavy this stuff is. Um, typically, a stone block is going to weigh approximately 160, 160 to 170 pounds per cubic foot. So it always cracks me up when there's like a stone block trap in a dungeon that's like 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet, which means, you know, you're talking like many many tons <laughs> of weight because when you 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 know you, you get the cubic foot so um in theory a stone block trap one not only would it be super impractical to set up but it will probably kill whoever fall <laughs> it falls upon <laughs> so jock make sure you're you're walking through your dungeon and uh or scotsman make sure you're walking through the dungeon and checking for stone blocks because i don't want jock to get crushed by a 80 ton block of stone because the designers of a dungeon didn't know any better uh but yeah like stuff like that's kind of cool to know knowing the basics of like um architecture and why certain things are where they are is going to be really helpful for you too like um how castles are designed um what the different fortifications are like practical stuff and it becomes more obvious when you get into really getting down and like building out this stuff like today i think i was looking up um uh, barbicans. A barbican is the front part of a castle because one of my players in my Mad Mage campaign wants to reinforce the front. And I said, well, what would be the most, what would make sense to, 
to reinforce the front of a fortress. So I started looking up Barbican design. So I'm probably going to do something like that with him. Um, the player himself may not have known that's what he did, but his his character is a stonemason dwarf. So my thought is like, he's going to look and be like, okay, this is what we need. We need a Barbican. We need a moat. You know, da, 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 da. So we'll probably see that develop over the next few weeks. Uh, there's downtime in the game too. So the game more or less runs in real time, which is kind of interesting. I mean, obviously combat's still, you know, a two hour combat, like, or a 30 second combat really takes like two hours in real life. But other than that, the game mostly chugs along in real time. So when there's downtime, it's actually done by each day. So if you want to build something, you're going to have to spend, you know, a certain number of days doing it. But I'm, I'm hoping to like update the graphics as I go. I think that make it kind of like a little bit more interesting. Like, oh, let me check in the day and see what my character's done this time in real time building stuff and what, how, I've, and I've added in like little doodads and stuff that, uh, using an asset packs from my buddy, Tom Cartos, um, patreon.com slash Tom Cartos, who has a lot of really cool assets in his library, which makes building out dungeons pretty nifty. So check his stuff out. I, I collaborate with him a lot. We've done a few adventures together. Uh, Kjar Defel, Kjar, Kjar Defel, his most recent one, which is a uh, two-part dungeon or there's two variants on it. One's um, for uh, fifth level characters. One's for ninth level characters. So let me check in on a question and see what people want. Uh, uh, I'm running back. Sarge says he's enjoying the ambiance never ending Mad Mage. Yeah, it's fun. And the chitness. <laughs> uh, ambiance changes made it fun. Um, something Mucky recommended for doors instead of deleting them is moving the line behind a wall line so you can move it back. Ah, it's not that big a deal. One bad thing about Roll20 dynamic line is you need to have extra thick walls and extra fat doors or else players can't see them or they look like part of the walls. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, the door has to stick out a bit and it has to be really clear what it is. I think, I think that's why I kind of like this traditional style like Tim Harton has, because he's got these big, thick, chunky doors, which really stand out. And um, so when the characters are wandering through the dungeon, let's go back to Derek, the drow. So when, like, our buddy Derek here is wandering through the dungeon, and he comes across a door, granted, I haven't blocked out the doors yet, but it's it's a little bit more obvious that there's there's doors there, right? Even if I go in, so typically when I have a door, I make it a, a thinner than the wall itself. So we'll go to um, our dynamic lighting layer. I use orange, so you get that nice complementary like balance with it. And what I do is I'll just draw from here to here. That way. When you've got a character who's looking at it, oh Jesus! I best then probably need to draw it on the dynamic lighting, huh? All right. Uh, like I was saying, don't forget to click. Don't forget to right click, kids. So. When our character is looking at it, they can tell that it's a door. They can't see through it. They can't move through it. But it's obvious like this is a door. And, it, you know, they might ask at first, like, oh, what's that? And it's like, um, it's a door. So anyways, yeah, good point on that. Like, just be really caught. It's always good to have, like, when you're setting up lighting, it's always good to have, like, a token. Like, I got my man Derek in here who can kind of see what's what <clears throat> in a perfect world. You've got full color maps and it's a little bit more obvious but keep in mind too like a lot of cartographers who do stuff for the books aren't necessarily designing it with roll 20 in mind they might these days um just because it's so prevalent um but like 
you would take like Mad Mage. Mad Mage has like a lot of cool stuff, but you can tell like there's some like some considerations weren't made. So I had to go in and like do a bunch of like edits on the dynamic lighting and stuff to make it um, a little bit more atmospheric, like especially with the forest and stuff on one of the levels. All right, let's go back to. I think we got some good progress so far, so we're gonna go back to. Alex, alarm off. For some reason, my alarm just went off, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see where we are. We are back up here, so we can see there's some weirdness here. Let's fix this. Uh, and. In a perfect world, men like me would not exist, but this is not the perfect world. Yeah, we could never be in a perfect world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I kind of like some tedious stuff like this. I mean, I like it now because I just started doing it. Maybe I'll get tired of it. Um, I've got people who also set this stuff up, but it's, uh, it's kind of nice. It's relaxing. Getting it all in there lets me like kind of brain dump to kind of what's on my mind. Ooh, long line here. Let's see if we can get this. Boom. Um, kind of think about all the stuff I want to talk about, like um. You know, I, I started the indie back in the 90s when I was a kid, and um, obviously it's a different game. You know, we didn't have the internet. I mean, or the internet was around. It was just super brand new. And interesting, like, some of the first things I ever got into online was uh, role-playing. Like, um, like, when AOL chat first kicked off around that time, um, right away people saw it as an opportunity to get role-playing going on which is kind of cool um probably because you know it's mostly set up in colleges <clears throat> so you had a lot of people who were already kind of like nerds for dnd &D and all the stuff dnd &D was really popular back in the uh the 90s and the 80s it's really when it started to like come out to zone i mean granted it's seeing it's like biggest realm of popularity ever but it really started getting attention um I'd say probably in the late eighties through the nineties, you know, they had a very like big golden era. And then the original company that <clears throat> owned the D and D label TSR ended up uh, collapsing under its own weight. Uh, they were trying to like stretch themselves too thin apparently. And that's a bad management and it was all pretty new. Then they didn't, you know, when, when you were like the first people to go out and do something, you don't like there's not like a lot of um there's no blueprints so you just kind of have to hope for the best and <laughs> and uh see you know throw a bunch against the wall and see what sticks uh they got bought by wizards of the coast i think right around the year 2000 and wizards of the coast like almost immediately got purchased by hasbro um started third edition and third edition is when the game really started to like clean up i would say second edition it's probably a bit of a mess i mean i i love it there's a lot of stuff in there that i liked it was a much deadlier game back then um there's a lot of training wheels on it now and the one thing that i think a lot of dms have trouble with is being afraid to be dangerous in their games. I like adding level danger. I don't, I don't like, let me put it this way. Like I don't have a problem with killing characters, but at the same time, I'm almost always rooting for the characters. I mean, I give my players shit all the time, but at the end of the day, like I want them to win and I want them to succeed. Um, and I want them to solve the problems that they're coming up against and and win um but at the same time you kind of have to establish boundaries with your story and the the game in itself 
because if you don't, um, you're going to have a pretty big power imbalance soon. And honestly, like if there isn't a level of danger, you're not going to make memorable sessions. Like, I mean, you might be able to, I mean, it, all games are different, but in my mind, D and D, which is dungeons and dragons, <laughs> uh, um, should have always a threat that your character can die. So I tend to play, I'm probably well known for playing a little hardcore, but at the same time, like take a few nights ago, I had two TPKs almost back to back. Uh, one TPK was with my old party. We're playing um, the Salt Marsh Adventure, Isle of the Abbey, which by the way is just absolutely brutal. Um, and questionably, questionably written because there's not a lot of warning signs that they're going to go into a dangerous fight. And the way it's written is that pretty much, unless you say the right thing, which is, is kind of hard to know, they, um, they're going to get their asses just beat. I mean, it's a huge challenge right from the get go. And that's, that's what happened. I mean, it may be my fault for not, really reviewing it and being like, okay, this is probably broken. I just kind of like grabbed it, assimilated what I could and then played it as like wisely as I could. But anyways, long story short, it ended up in a TPK. All well, one of them got knocked unconscious and left naked on the beach and is now insane, which is, you know, a story for another time. But <laughs> um, at the end of the day, like it was pretty brutal, but at the same time, like, like when this kind of stuff happens, my, like, I'm not like excited. I'm not like, yeah, I'm going to go kill some characters. I mean, I might joke about it, but at the same time, like, I'm like, oh man, you know, these are cool characters. Granted, they were still pretty relatively new. I don't think it, with the exception of the one guy who survived, which is kind of funny. None of them had really been around for more than a few weeks because they all ended up, uh, that same group of players had a bunch of characters wiped out. Uh, not too long before. So kind of heartbreaking on that too, eh? <laughs> but anyways, um, after that game ended, I did my dun Dungeon of the Mad Mage and um, the characters went down into uh, one of the connecting levels and they ran into some pretty... They went into a room that had uh, Grace Slod hitting in him hiding in it and if you don't aren't familiar with gray slot they're like um like these frog people from the elemental realm of chaos they can cast spells um innately so they're pretty tough and they carry great swords i mean it's like the most random collection of abilities it's so bizarrely old school um <laughs> like yeah he's got a great sword and uh he can cast fireball sure <laughs> so um they they had done pretty good in the dungeon so far so like you could tell that their sense of self-preservation was starting to lack like perception checks were going out the windows doors weren't getting checked there's no 10-foot poles um and i love you guys if you're listening and i, I think some of you are and this is just kind of like my take on it um on what happened a few nights ago they just were kind of like i think they had had some early encounters in the dungeon and they're like oh well this place is easy the worst we've run into so far is like an umber hulk you know and one umber hulk's not a big challenge um and they were getting pretty good but then they ran into two slot and, and gray slot are cr9 monsters i mean they're on par with uh some of your toughest giants and they deal crazy damage. They have magic resistance. I mean, yada, yada, yada. Like, just jacked monsters. Well, the uh, one of the characters went in and right away just got trashed. And they hadn't done a very good job of, like, hiding the fact that there was a bunch of them there. So the second one just steps out the door and starts lobbing fireballs. I mean... Um, fireball after fireball started going off and you're dealing with a party that had some higher level characters but also had some like third level characters so a little little thing to note too is um, I'm starting people 
at level three in Dungeons and Mad Mage, no matter where the other people are. And it seems like, Dave, that's crazy. I was like, well, yeah, but again, it's there needs to be an element of danger. And if you run these books like they're supposed to be, when characters start getting to their second tier, it starts getting to be like a lot easier for them. And if things are too easy, like, yeah, it might be fun to like, I mean, this is my philosophy too. I don't know if everybody's like this. Not everybody, not everybody might like my games. You know, I, I mean, I don't give a shit. They're my games. <laughs> you know, if you don't want to play them, that's fine. But my, my thing is like, the, the games you're going to remember aren't going to be the ones where you one shot, um, like a chimera, right? The ones you're going to remember, I mean, you might have bragging rights for something like that, but the ones you're really going to remember are the, the dangerous encounters where you narrowly survived, um, you know, against all odds and, or, you know, somebody ended up dying. Like in my previous campaign that went from one to 20, one of the most memorable encounters was, in my opinion, was when they were all down in a dungeon with some crew thick and I had my first ever um, character death in this uh, edition was the barbarian ended up dying to the crew thick. And it like it's it was memorable. I mean, it was it was sad. There were some a lot of heroics. Everybody ended up surviving. Um Again, it was the result of a bad decision. In this case, it was um, crew thicker drawn to heat. So somebody lobbed a fireball and ended up drawing them all to their lair. And that's that's always what I'm going to do. Like, I'm never going to try to pound on people just for the sake of pounding on them and be like, her, her, her. Like, I want to be able to, like, when all is said and done, say, what what dangers have um what reasons did this occur why did um why did this situation happen and if it's like on me then like i'm gonna feel bad so i need to make like i try to make it as clear as possible like well bad decisions were made if that door with the slide i think if like they had been like well let's detect the door um let's see if there's anything weird going on there let's cast detect magic let's um try to be safe there would have been a better chance of survival now interestingly only one person ended up getting killed in that it was very close to a tpk but they did a really good job of reviving those who fell to the four freaking fireballs i pounded them with and um dragging like they're wounded out of there and it man my heart was pounding because there's one seven level character who's kind of become like an iconic um character who or six level i can't remember six level i think who was pretty close to to getting killed like they managed to save him but one of the characters did another person who's been playing probably for a whole month and did end up having his character killed the slides Toss the guy into a dwarven trash compactor and press the button, and it was pretty, it's pretty gruesome. But at the same time, like, you know, there's there were consequences, and I also, you know, I, I really wanted to establish like, even when you're doing good, there's the chance that there's going to be a danger, and because I make everybody start at level three. It's gonna be, it's gonna be like you're gonna have to be safer and safer as you go up in levels. Because if you get to level nine, and your character dies, you don't want to go back to level three. So you gotta, it's a self preservation. So I think, I think you'll see with a lot of the characters that their, um, the way they play has become a lot safer. But like I said, the uh, the other night it looked like it was slipping away. Like they were getting. They were getting too comfortable. So another thing to note is I, I don't like with Mad Mage, other than like some I, I've made some changes in levels they've cleared. Uh, I haven't changed anything from the way it is. So um, so far, everything's more or less been the way the book tells me to run it. So if the book says these guys are waiting here and they attack and kill anything that comes in the room, 
that's exactly what's going to happen. But if also if it says like, oh, there's A, B, and C guys here, and if um, if you don't, or if if they get knocked out, you'll end up in like Skullport or something. So um, yeah, so there there are some of that there. Uh, the only things I did remove is there's something in the game that prevents people from going to levels uh, for which they're not level ready. And I wanted to get rid of that because I wanted to establish to like, hey, this place is dangerous, but you're going to have to like take your time. Like you're not going to be going to level 23 tomorrow. You're going to be going. Uh, you got to be like a little safer than that. You got to think about this. And they've done really good, man. It's 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 I think it's getting more and more interesting because like these interesting character stories are starting to develop and they're really like learning to work together and using good tactics. And like, people are like less prone to being like Rambo and stuff <laughs> and, you know, and, and thinking about the party, because when you're down in a level that's built for 13th level characters and you've got a third level guy with you, you need to like make sure that dude is safe. You're in charge of him. And the story is like, they can't get back up. So once somebody goes down, they're stuck there. So you, they become your charge and you have to keep them safe. And it's been, it's been a ton of fun. I've really enjoyed playing with all the different players. Cause it's, it's, you know, it's, there's so far been 23 different people down in the dungeon. And, uh, uh, I mean, granted, you know, like I'd say like a handful of people like played once and never played again, but for the most part, um, everybody's wanted to come back and do it. So that, that to me is like really tells me I'm doing what it's supposed to do. And, and like the player deaths, like haven't been taken sorely, which is kind of nice. Like they understand, like, I think they understand what's up and know that when there's a danger, it should be treated with respect. Gosh, I hate drawing these circles. <laughs> really? I really wish there was like a better, I wish there was an erase tool. God, that would make this shit way easier. There's no erase tool. You just have to do it. And, Try to get it perfect the first time and or get it good enough <laughs> and move on. So yeah, anyways, um yeah, I like a little bit danger. I like to dial down what the books say to do. Um I mean, especially if we're playing in two hour increments, they can they can blow all their resources for the day because they're gonna do a long rest like by default um shortly after. Ugh, I drew this kind of funky. This is sloppy, but it's just a little bit too thick. Yeah, so they'll get a long rest at the end of um, each day. So it, gives, it like literally gives them time to like recuperate. So they can go in and fight two fights that are way above their level and beat them. And there's a chance that they'll get killed. But... Um, if you go by the Adventuring Day XP charts on, um, I think it's like page 84 or so, of the DMG, um, they're more or less staying within the, the realm of that. And the only time I've, like, the other night, yeah, they blew through most of their resources fighting, like, two or three encounters. But, I mean, it, it's good because, like, that sense of danger is there. And, like, if I were to run it at the normal level... Um, and run like a you know your typical four or five hour session then uh that'd be one thing but because it's only two hours at a time you kind of got to go through those resources sooner to add the element of danger because if they came in fresh and were fighting up against things that are like easy or medium encounters i mean they're going to leave that dungeon pretty much the way they came in so it's okay to go a little bit levels above you just it's just more of an experience thing like you have to kind of know what works and what doesn't um tier one characters are like considerably weaker than tier two characters and then tier three characters are i mean they're a little bit better but they're not like leaps and bounds better like the difference between one and um uh... oh crap i forgot to leave a blank for this see shoot Got to leave a gap for the secret door. Wah, wah, wah. So I got to go back and do that whole circle again. Yeah, be cognizant of like where your secret doors are going to go um, when you're drawing, hand drawing stuff like this. Now I'm going to have to go back 
and do this sloppy ass circle again. You know, what is it they say on Parks and Rec? It's not government work if you don't have to do it twice. <laughs> uh, let me take a look at some questions. What do people want to know? Uh, did I ever read or own any of the old TSR books novels? Uh, yeah, I got a lot of them. I used to, when I was a kid, I used to read um, the Ravenloft books, and uh, I read some of the uh, old Dragonlance um, novels. I always draw the outside of my walls. Never have seen someone fill in the dark spots. So the walls are all that is left. Might have to try it this way. Huh. <laughs> and then Scotsman says that they were slacking off. <laughs> Not looking to engage anything. Yeah, stop slacking off. You're going to get people killed. You're supposed to be a leader, sir. Um, yeah, I like... Like I used to try to be, when I started adventure writing, which I really only just started specializing in within the last year, only because there's not a lot of people who do it um, that that aren't either working for Wizards of the Coast or doing DMG stuff or DMs Guild and stuff. Um, I started doing it <clears throat> like full time back in September. And I've really learned even a lot in this amount of time because I'm, I'm a pretty prolific writer, as I'm sure some of you know. And uh, that looks good. Like, um, I, I, I learn a lot by looking at mostly the older books um, in particular because they... Um, they really give me some cool ideas. And a lot of times what's cool is with the old dungeon designs is they weren't really like super logical. Like they had some like, um, some things that make sense, but for the most part, like they just went with what was cool. Like it didn't really have to make sense that like there was a um like why would a gray slot be working with halister i was like well it doesn't matter it's cool it's a neat fight <laughs> just roll with it so i i kind of like originally i was like all about like oh it doesn't make sense that this would be there and this you know it's weird and blah 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 but over time i've just i've just kind of like rolled with it and just kind of accepted like weird stuff goes on and um like sometimes dungeons just have weird things and uh, there's some other like interesting things that I think really make for um, just fascinating gameplay or fascinating dungeon design, like using like certain spells <clears throat> to um, create practical effects like, um, like using brown mold, for example, to turn, make a freezer, like, like that would seem like crazy and dangerous, but to most people, but then again, I mean, keep in mind, like if you take off the back of your microwave in the real world, you'll electrocute yourself, even if the thing's unplugged. So it's the same kind of like thought I mentioned with these guys. Like, yeah, they don't have a mind. They don't mind putting brown mold in a place. They just, everybody knows like, yeah, don't touch that dummy <laughs> or, or you'll, you'll take, you know, 48 freezing damage. And that's just the world they live in. So like stuff like that might seem weird. You just have to think about like stuff that's weird in the, in the real world. Cause obviously the real world is, you know, most days it's a hot mess. It's just, you're used to the weird things. And when you in a world with magic, these people are going to be used to weird things going on too. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really dig the old dungeons. Um, and it's it's nice to have like a nice big blend so when i go back and i read dungeons one thing i think that surprises a lot of people is that i tend not to run my own stuff i mean i've got a lot of play testers who are on it and i'm 
I know dungeon design and, and adventure design pretty well. But a lot of times I just like to see, like get feedback from people. And when I'm learning, I like to learn what other people are doing and learn how they design things so I can implement it or um, improve what I'm doing. It's same same kind of thing with like a fiction writer. Like if you ask Stephen King what kind of stuff he reads, he's not going to tell you. I mean, he probably reads some fiction, but a lot of times they're going to read a lot of nonfiction too. It seems weird. You know, like if you're a big fiction writer, well, how come you don't read horror? And he'll tell you it's because, you know, like he understands the horror genre. There's no need to, to keep reading it. And also, I mean, you don't want to subconsciously steal ideas, but like if you read outside of your genre, like nonfiction, like I read a lot of nonfiction. I don't read fiction at all, to be honest. Watch a, I've watched a lot of TV shows. I think that would count as my fiction. Uh, but like I, I don't read fiction. Um, so it's kind of in the same way, like I don't really run my own adventures that often because I, I really want to learn other things, good or bad. Um, so like, for example, I at the Abbey, I think was a poorly designed adventure. <laughs> it, I mean, it had some cool elements that I look forward to getting to, but we never got to that point because that first encounter is just beyond deadly with very like little to no telegraphing that there was something to be concerned about. Um, it might, like I said, it might be my fault for not reading through the whole thing you know, trying to like improv and I mean, I didn't even improv. I just went with the book, but trying to like speed read through it and get the basic concepts down. But looking over and over again through that battle, it's like, this thing was mean. <laughs> oh, well, that's D&D. &D. It's just numbers on paper. You always make a new character. Um, Jeez. All these damn circles. Circle, circle, circle. All right. I think... I think I got all my circles done. I think I might have this whole thing laid out. So there we go. All the dynamic lighting's been put out. Didn't take too long at all. It's about an hour of work, maybe. So thanks for bearing with me through that. I hope you found some of my stories interesting. Um, and if you didn't, well, you can go to hell. <laughs> um, the other things I would do on this next would be these columns, putting in uh, light breakers for that. I've seen two ways of doing it. Um, so usually these gray blobs will be columns. You can either do it with, let me go, probably need Derek for this. Where's Derek? He's off wandering over here. So let's get back to Derek. Whoa, look at this crazy place. Oh. All right, so we can see we've got most of our outlines. And what I'll do before we're all said and done, one thing I want to check, I tried something kind of neat with these staircases. Like, wow, look at this. That's great. Stairs are so wide in D&D. &D. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a 10 foot wide staircase, like other than like a mansion, but I guess these places are super massive. So whatever. Um, so there are two modes of thought when doing dynamic lighting for columns that I've seen so far, and there might be other styles, but these are the ones I think that are most common. First, you're gonna have kind of the obvious you're going to have to just make a shape, right? So if you hold down your option key while doing the shape, it creates a circle. And we can select and put that kind of where we want it to be. The other way people do it is um, by creating an X. Which I think might give it like a little bit more blocking out. Um, what I'm kind of interested in, and I'm going to test out with y'all right now. So, okay, so you can see the difference in it. Like this, you can see this looks like a little bit more circular. This is, you can definitely see the X pattern. It, it's not blocking them either way. Actually, this one's blocking them. All right. 
yeah, but I can't go that way. This on the other hand, like is fine. So I don't see any reason why to do the X. Maybe somebody who knows roll 20 a little bit better than me can explain, but I'm just going to go with, um, I think the circles is kind of cooler. Um, but please correct me if I'm wrong. I frequently am wrong. I'm used to being wrong. I've been wrong my whole life. I'm still wrong. I pay people now to tell me I'm wrong. It's, it's fun. That's all owning a business is, is just paying people to tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> and, and being like, okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> well, if you want to be a good business owner, if you want to own a business and always believe you're right, well, you're not going to get very far. But good business owners, and I'm not saying I'm a good business owner. God help me, I'm probably shit. But I like I like people telling me if I'm wrong and backing it up with facts. But hey, plenty of people get by in this world without ever thinking they're wrong. Some people even become world leaders. So, uh, let's see. They slacked off and then got yelled at by their wizard. Yep. Dave's stuff is designed to be hard for any of those who have not ran anything. True life is scarier than fiction. Umbral Fortress level five. Oh yeah, Umbral Fortress is just a mess, but you know what? I don't care. <laughs> hey, not all my stuff's perfect. <laughs> Circles cause a ton of tiny lines, and each new line is another calculation. Ah, awesome feedback, Bruce. So there you have it. Circles make tiny lines. So let's get rid of these blasted circles. Circles are like candles. We must get rid of candles at all costs. Cannot be having circles in my super secret dungeon. <clears throat> All right, so let's do our polygon line tool. We're going to put in some X's, which make life easier, apparently. Give a little bit more thickness to our columns, too. Boop. And thank you, Bruce, for the useful information. I am by no means a Roll20 expert. Um, I don't think I'm an expert in anything. Maybe in being a freak writer but if you want to know the secret to writing and this is true it's one do it a lot do it every day there's no day off in writing if you want to be a writer you have got to do it every single day and like anytime you go to a writing group and they're like oh just 500 words a day do not listen to that you need to it's like um yeah, okay, maybe you can start with that, like if you've never been a writer before. But if you want to be a successful writer, you need to treat it like going to the gym or even training for a marathon or being any kind of like long distance runner. Because frankly, if you're not writing, buku's and buku amount of material every day you're going to find it hard to compete and everybody wants to be like, um, take what's her name? Like, um, uh, Harper Lee, right? Harper Lee really only ever wrote one book for which she's known, which is to kill a mark and to kill a mockingbird. And there's a lot of luck in that. I mean, no, it's a great book. Don't, I'm not saying it's just luck, but I'm saying like, there's a lot of great books that are written every day that nobody ever will read in their entire life. And <clears throat> when you're a writer, you have to be, if you want to succeed, you got to be prolific. And it, it really, really comes down to um, quantity a lot of times. Now, you need to be, that's not to say you don't have to have talent. Talent is going to help. And that's not to say that you shouldn't know how to write. You should definitely know the basics of writing and you should know the basics of writing well. Um, I highly recommend, 
um, Strunk and White's Elements of Style. It's an old book. It's really small, but it gives you like the basics on what you should know. You know, um, like avoid passive language, which I still, you know, I'm probably bad about. Um, you don't. You don't have to be flowery. Use active. Um, you know, use action lines instead of like passive stuff. Uh, like get rid of adverbs. Adverbs are weak. You know, use transitions, things like that, that you should know as a writer. But again, that's just the basic building blocks. That's not going to make you successful. Like anybody can write well. Um, being a talented writer is its own thing. You know, uh, there's plenty of talented writers out there. But the, ultimately, if you want to be seen for what you're writing, you need to do it enough and you need to get it in front of people. So, and you need to do that as fast as possible. Um, if you're going to sit down and say you're going to go write like the next um, uh, Song of Ice and Fire, right? And you want to write like a five book fantasy series. <clears throat> you can work your butt off writing that book for the next six months. But the thing is, when you go to release it, nobody's going to give a shit. They don't know you. They don't know what you're capable of. You have to make fans as you go. And you have to get feedback as quickly as you can. Because the last, you don't want to write a 400-page book and then have people tell you, oh, well, this is goofy and this is kind of dumb here and this is this and this and this and this. Like, you need to, like... I mean, people are going to have their own opinions, you know, and you're just going to, I mean, some, a lot of opinions, you could just be like, oh, whatever, who cares? Um, but like the bigger things, like you need to, to be aware of. And the best way to do that is through basically what is known as a business theory called lean testing. Um, you create what's called a minimum viable product, basically the most perfect version that you can give to someone without all the, necessarily all the bells and whistles that you can get feedback from almost immediately. And then using that feedback, you can incorporate data or you can, um, the, the feedback is the data and you can learn from it and, and make improvements. And the faster that you can do that, that you can ship and then iterate the better you will get at stuff and the and the quicker you will learn and improve your craft and that that goes with pretty much anything say i mean even if you were to like work out right like the things that you notice you're getting gains from obviously you're gonna keep doing that right you're not gonna and then same thing if you're not getting any gains from something that you're doing at the gym why are you gonna repeat doing that you know like if you're and that's that's how anything needs to be like writing uh definitely has to be that way because you need to learn what you're getting gains or in such a case it's going to be like uh fans or like more readers or whatever whether they're paid or just people following you and you need to learn from what you've done in the past in order to do that so that's been my philosophy with writing uh i started writing full-time writing for business and entrepreneurship, doing uh, answering questions on Quora. And I would answer 25 questions a day. And then the ones that would get the most upvotes, like I would start duplicating kind of like my answers there and then targeting the same questions like that. And after a while, I became like number one in like, oh my God, like 10 categories. And eventually got banned <laughs> for uh, uh, spam. They thought I was just like cutting and pasting. I wasn't, I'm just a freak. But um, yeah, like that's how I learned writing. And then I applied that same method to when I, when I got into D&D &D writing. Like the first thing I ever created was probably like a monster block where I was really learning, you know, how to craft my own games. And then I, I built out from there. And I used to post on Reddit, which Reddit can be like the worst because there's no, there's no holds barred on people's like goofy opinions. But if you want to learn and grow, if you can read through the crap opinions and see like actually the good ones that will help you like learn then um, that was a good way to learn. 
and now you know i've got patreon and stuff and like i'm i'm always trying to improve what i've done before and like but even then like my originally on patreon like i just made like random shit i made subclasses and things like that but then when i learned that there was a, a like a market demand for adventures and things like dms that's what i put out and you'll see like i'll, I'll still put out surveys and I'm, I'm always trying to learn and improve and um lately i've been trying to make my content more applicable for um people running online games because of COVID-19. So yeah, if you're ever interested in like being successful in anything, um, you've got to use the lean startup method, which is, it's always going to be um, create, ship it as fast as you can in front of people. I mean, make sure that it's like, you know, the perfect example of what you're trying to create. It doesn't have to be like, you don't have to finish the whole book, but you can write like a chapter, you can write a page. Make sure you get feedback on it. And then feedback too isn't just like people telling you like, oh, well, I think it should be this. <laughs> like, be quiet, Derek the Drow. I'll tell you what I think it should be. It should be like feedback can be followers on Instagram. It can be pay new patrons. Like, use data as your friend to know, like, make it your canary in a cave to know what works and what doesn't. And that's how you're going to be successful. It's, it's not hard. I mean, and you'll see that other successful people who who are like me, who've made it in, in this business, they have the exact same philosophies, whether or not they know, like, that's what they've been doing. Like they may, they may not necessarily know like what they're doing is, you know, the lean method, but I mean, that's ultimately what it is, is just that. Um, the other thing too is, is, uh, content is ultimately at the end of the day, it's like a drug and you gotta, you gotta make sure that you point out, put out plenty because uh, you want to keep constant interest. Like a, a lot of the people that I follow online are very good about um, keeping people interested in their brand by releasing content each day and constantly, you know, staying top of mind. So like I, I follow, I'm not a classical musician, but I follow these two guys on Instagram or on Facebook called a, two set violin there are a couple of violin players out of australia um and they put out funny content and like yeah I'm, i don't i don't listen to classical music i don't play an instrument but they're charming and they make 10 minute videos and they come out every single day without fail i mean covid19 be damned <laughs> so it's the uh, um and i follow them probably because just consistency like um you know they've always got new material to put out and i it's pretty much what they do for a living now. Like they've made, um, they may not be like the world's best musicians and they'll tell you, you know, they're not, and they, they'll, they'll tell you who they really like. Just like, I'm not the world's best writer or even adventure writer, but at the same time, like I'm just prolific and I, I try to stay, try to stay top of mind and try to keep new stuff going and try to keep it fresh. And that's all you need to do. So really in the internet world, you know, if you can become like a ritual, or a habit for um, someone. Like if you were the first thing, like take um perfect example, Randall Monroe writes a comic called XKCD. You can go to xkcd.com and check it out. <clears throat> Dude has put out a comic every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday without fail for the last, uh, God, I, I was reading him before I met my wife, and that was 10 years ago. So um, at least a decade, probably almost two decades. Um, and he's, it's his lifestyle now. And XKCD is, like, read by, like, Bill Gates and um, Elon Musk. And, like, you know, it's it's a really well-known comic. And it's the consistency more than anything. And dude just makes stick figures. It's, it's there's no like like whoa what crazy talent he just drew stick figures and made jokes about like science and i'll be i mean i'll be honest with you some of the times that shit's like way over my head like i i don't get this <laughs> but at the same time like i still check it out pretty regularly because when it is stuff that's kind of like in my realm like it's pretty funny um and he makes some really cool stuff sometimes you know like for every five <clears throat> Um, comics that he does that are kind of small and he'll do like one or two really big ones and then he'll put out like a book and just a, just a super clever 
clever guy. But yeah, it's a consistency that's that's always drawn back. Even like in worst case scenarios, like like I think his wife or something got sick some some years ago, and um, he still found a way to like get regular content. He got like friends to cover. Oh my god, just draw a straight line. Uh, this drove me nuts. Yeah, anyways, he got friends to cover the content for him. So he was still putting his stuff out. It wasn't by him, but he was still keeping his audience in check. And um, another comic that I used to read, like religiously, uh, Order of the Stick, like I really liked it, but um, the guy who would create it, like there would be like month long periods where he wouldn't make anything. And I'm like, uh. And I'm not, I don't have, I'm not the most consistent person ever. Like I know sometimes like, like take my monsters, for example, like I was supposed to make one every day and I got a little bit behind because the, the business started taking off and there were some life changes, but, uh, you know, and the world ending viruses, but, um, definitely one thing I want to make sure that I try to do and try to improve on is my overall consistency and making sure that I'm putting out plenty of good stuff. So anyways, uh, that's me on my soapbox on just content creation in general and yeah, doing what I do. The, I think ultimately everybody wants to, you know, everybody wants to do something that they love to do. And when I set out on this journey a couple years ago, I was already a business owner. I was, um, like, uh, I was selling stuff on Amazon, but I didn't really care about the stuff that I sold. I mean, it was just like, it wasn't exciting to me. I just picked them because they were profitable and they were, I mean, I, I did pretty good. Like I made like, gosh, like my first year with one product, I made like 17 grand net, like on a holiday season. It was like, oh, that's awesome. But it was just boring. I'm like, man, I don't care about all this. And then when like the product started failing because of um, issues I was having with vendors, I told myself, I was like, man, if I'm going to stick with online entrepreneurship, I want it to be something like I actually care about. And I, I don't know why I picked D and D and like, I always knew like I wanted it to be board games and I was thinking about making my own, my own role playing game. And then I learned about the uh, OGL and the SRD and I thought that was really cool. So yeah, I mean, long story short, like I, I bought the fifth edition. I hadn't played since third. Um, so I totally skipped fourth somehow <laughs> and, uh, yeah, like I got, found a group, which is still my group to this day. It's my the bloody bunch. Just really started learning the game, started a blog, uh, dmdave.com. I was surprised, man, I was really surprised that the domain wasn't taken. I was like, how has nobody gotten this? My now, suckles. Um, <laughs> I just started creating content, built an Instagram on it where I shared stuff, started posting on Reddit. Um, yeah, just pretty simple. You know, my, I just use my lean method, just write new stuff, post it out, see what people think, go back and do it again over and over and over again. And here we are today, you listening to me, all nine of you. <laughs> or however many are all eight of you. <laughs> um, all seven of you just losing fans as I go. Um, listening to me drone on about nonsense while I'm designing a dungeon. But hey, you know what? I was going to be doing this anyway. So why, why not add value? Alas. So yeah, I mean, this is this is pretty much it. Normally, I, I, I haven't in the past started with Dungeons in Roll20, but um, I kind of wanted to experiment with it now because I need a dungeon for <clears throat> my Saturday games anyways, since I don't think they want to go back to the Isle of the Abbey. <laughs> um, so I figured I would, I would test this out and kind of see and really get a feel for it. Um... Now that I've got all my doors in place, oh, need my secret doors. Secret door. Do, 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 do. Um, 
just going to draw use the box to get as straight a line as possible because I don't want the, there to be any kind of hint that there's a secret door there. So if I did it with like my polygon tool, likely you would see the indentation. Uh, oops, forgot one over here. Yeah, I don't mind the indentation when there's, it's obviously supposed to be a door, but these secret doors should be secret. And I want to do it both, like, both, so, like, this one in particular, like, if I just did a line here, like, it may not, like, it, it'll look off. But if I do with the box, I can delete the whole box when they find it or move it aside or whatever or put it on GM layer, yada, yada, yada. Um, but I can adjust it so it lines up perfectly. And then when I go back through with Derek to check... See, it's not lined up right, so I get all those pi pixel perfect to keep it super hidden. So you don't want you don't want the map to give away the secret. That's bogus. I had that happen in in one of the uh, yawning portal modules. Like the the lighting was all screwed up, so like the secret doors were like like super obvious. I was like, boo, <laughs> um, kind of sucked. So. Um, we're going to try to keep these nice and secret. Secret door. Whoops. Oh, we got to pick the color, not the. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right. I think I've got. All my doors in there. I'm not gonna like. I could block these trees, but I think that's kind of unnecessary. Just because they're not. I mean, that's the edge of the map. Who cares? I think it makes the point. Like you're coming through the woods and you find this cliff, and you don't want to block the cliff either because the thing about the dynamic lighting is it it goes on like forever until the edge of the screen. So you um you can't see through it so you're gonna have to role play a lot of stuff like hey this cliff is you know 90 feet up or uh, uh however many feet up tim has it i'll have to look at the original map but yeah if you block the line of sight it's gonna look stupid um and there's still gonna be some describing going on like i'm gonna have to describe what this big round doodad is uh, fortunately, there's an upper level, so maybe like there'll be other ways to get in. That's kind of what I want to do with this this whole thing is I want to make it like really versatile and like have lots of different ways to enter. But I think we've got most of our stuff done. So after you put in your dynamic lighting, you're gonna want to um, get your token. So I'm gonna get Derek here, and I'm gonna have him run through the dungeon through every room to make sure it looks good. Okay. So we can see our columns look really good. Let's check down here and make sure. Yeah, it looks pretty good. <clears throat> you got that little edge there, which is nice. Um, it has just a little bit of texture. So we can see it's not just darkness. So that's kind of nice. Um, something to note, like um, in your, uh, when you're in your like your full view layer, you can move through lines. But when I'm in my player only view, it will it will follows the same rules. Might want to check the columns too, so you can see here like this column for example, I can't move through. So be cognizant of stuff like that. I'm not going to be too picky about it right now, but like if I was really picky, I'd try to get it so because I think it's fun to like be able to hide behind a column and be like, ha, surprise, mofo. And then the stairs looks pretty cool. That's cool. And you can like really experiment with the 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 line effects. You know, see see what kind of cool stuff you can do. Like I like I like curtains, for example. Like this is a curtain or a tapestry over here. And if you do it just right, um, with the dynamic lighting. So like take this for example. Like if I did it like. Oh, for the love of like if I did it like let's see if I can get it to do that effect that I can do like this and I put Derek back in there 
Derek, where are you? <sighs> I always do that. Like I said, if I put it like this, whoops. Um, now we've got like the kind of the curtain there and look, he can walk behind it, which is kind of nifty, right? So like if you've got a, con a door concealed behind a curtain, instead of like just having to be like, oh, you don't see it. You can actually like hide it just by putting a line and like, oh, there's something hidden back here. Ew, nifty. Or you could even have like a bad guy hiding back there, which would be kind of cool. So some stuff to think about with uh, dynamic lighting designs, I think can be kind of cool. And just like, uh, you know, like I really like, I really like the staircase. Oh, that's kind of ugly. So this is the kind of stuff you want to look for. You want to look for gaps in the light that you want to try to fix. Um, I'm going to use my polygon tool or not my polygon tool, my freehand tool. So there's a tiny little gap and it's, it's, you can't even really see it on here, but we're just going to go like this, cover it up and go back to Derek and make sure it's gone. So yeah, there we go. So yeah, you want to look for like tiny little breaks in light. They're going to be mostly common like around doors and other weird objects. So like really around doors, you should like, move back and forth to make sure that there's nothing over there. I've done a pretty good job of drawing the line. So if you're going to draw a line, instead of drawing it from point to point, instead of like draw it just over it, because remember, they're not going to be able to see any of that stuff. So it doesn't matter, especially with secret doors. You want to make really make sure. So let's make sure we test out this guy here. Yeah, we can see the S, but remember, your, your players aren't going to be able to see the S. Same with the uh, the northern one that we've got here. Let's make sure. Yeah, like we can see the S, but if we get rid of, like there's no indication like there's a secret door in here. So they're gonna have to like search or have some sort of clue that lets them know that that is right there. It's kind of a lumpy, looking at that round room now, it's kind of lumpy looking, but I and mean, yeah, I mean, they're not gonna notice it because of the dark. So that's another thing too. You don't have to be like crazy detailed. Um, just good enough because it's going to blend in enough with this pattern that I'm using. If it was like a brighter, like if it was like a white wall or white marble or something, it might be more obvious. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this is all I'm going to do. I'm just going to run around, check all my uh, doors, make sure my dungeon's looking good. And if you scroll all the way out, you can see like you can only see what's within his line of sight. There's another curtain that we might be able to make some cool effect with. Again, and they are like, I love, I love this effect because, you know, he's a drow and he has dark vision just fades off into nothing over here. So there's a lot of like cool hidden stuff, even with a hundred. I mean, like your, your typical dark vision is going to be, um, 60 feet. So really it's like super spooky. And when he comes in, I mean, you might have shit hidden here, hidden here behind the columns. I mean, possibilities are kind of endless. Do we have a gap there? It looks like we're pretty gap free so far. So yeah, that's great. Um Yeah, I think we did a pretty good job with this. Uh portcullises. Okay, so here's another thing that we can do real quick. Um you can draw portcullises. There's again, there's two ways to do it. We can do a freehand, but again, it's like the more kind of effects that you add in the more it might slow down your browser. So be cognizant of that. So like if I did my free hand here and just drew in boop, 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 boop. And went back to my token layer. You can see, yeah. I mean, it's not really doing much to block it. Uh, it's not blocking him either. I think what the the big time designers normally do with the dynamic lighting on this is a little bit more like this. And I've seen this in Mad Mage. So they still want you to be able to see through it, but they are making it 
so it's really hard to pass through. So instead they do porculuses like this. Doesn't have to be perfect, but just enough to like, <sighs> should be blocking him. All right, just gotta get a little bit, all right, blocks right there. Oh, well, one win. <laughs> um, yeah, we want this to block so they can't go through. So let's get rid of all this and try again. Make the gaps super small now. Hopefully that'll do it. I figure if we do mostly over the uh, the grid line there, that it should block. And, and I'm intentionally leaving these gaps so we can see through it. All right, great. Now I can't get through. So I made these super small gaps. And you can see it's kind of a cool effect. Like, ooh, what's in there? And then you have to find some way to open it up, whether it's, you know, just using a strength check or finding some sort of widget that opens it might be kind of a cool challenge, especially since this has an upper level that's, you know, you might have people who get clever and climb up onto. Uh, let me check these other two secret doors, make sure that they look nice and clean. Yeah, it looks good. Yep. Secret doors that are like within secret doors like that, like you can telegraph this one. But you don't really have to telegraph this one because if they can find this one, chances are they're gonna, I mean, nobody's gonna walk through a corridor and incident end and be like, well, duh. And a lot of times too, maybe make them obvious from the other side. But I think we're pretty good and I think we're set up in the light. And that's, that's pretty much it. We've got the whole joint set up looking good. Oh my gosh, stop. Um, we got it, you know, the dungeon here, got this first level done. Um, all we got to do is stock it now. So, um, look at some more questions and probably, yeah, dynamic lighting pinholes for my plan. <laughs> I don't take naps. No, I do. I take naps all the time. Um... Probably scared everybody off at this point. No, I still got seven people watching. All right. Okay, so we've got our basic dungeon set up in the map, and now it comes down to deciding what we want to put into this map. Um, I like old school modules. It's really, since I've been using Roll20 a lot, I've been going more with the old school way of thinking and setting it up so that adventure hooks are very simple like the village is always some amorphous place where people can buy stuff you know nearby village nearby town i don't really have to show that um you just kind of want to say like here's the adventure hook and let's go and i think that works really well with roll 20. when tabletop storytelling it may be a little bit different and maybe i'm wrong but this has just kind of like been my experience and which is why like some of my writing has gone more towards these event based or these location based versus event based um, sets just because like it's it's very visual and with visual like maps like these work really well but um, I'm, I'm pretty much cutting out a lot of the fluff that would be in like some of my more traditional storytelling methods like a uh, hand of the eight and things like that and just going straight for like okay there's this place you got to go check it out and see what's up now if you don't have if you don't necessarily have a good idea of the reasons why they should go there if you go to chapter five of the dmg and i love the dmg i use it a lot and i think i think it's a big mistake anytime anyone's like oh the dmg is worthless blah blah blah, blah. i was like well it is if you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> but if you know what you're doing and you're you you know you get good at like role playing because keep in mind what's going into the DMG here is is like 40 years of role playing games 
condensed into it and everything in here and then yeah there's some some mechanical stuff like you know obviously the magic items is probably like the biggest re reason people get the dmg but like the other chapters about the world building and adventure environments and like all these other little rules are really important because this kind of stuff is going to come up and if you want to be more than just a dm who's having combats because honestly yeah if you just want to do combat all the time just grab the player's handbook open up to the combat section get the monsters manual and go to town but if you want to make it like an actual game of DD &D with exploration and role playing and all that stuff then you need to understand the dmg because this stuff is going to make you much more flexible as a dm and help you um build more solid games and like when your players hit you with things that you haven't planned for you know exactly or you don't not that you know what to do but you're you're knowledgeable enough that you can create that event and and build it around there and if you don't know the answer right away you can rely on a random table um, which there are plenty of in the dmg so anyways that's enough of my uh uh ranting about that but um i'm gonna go to chapter five dungeon environments there are typically there are um two types kind of three types of adventures in DD. you have um location based and then you have event based dungeons or event based adventures um a let's see and if you go to, I want to say it's chapter three. Yeah, chapter three has the actual roles for creating adventures. Sorry, I said chapter five, but we'll go back to that. You have two adventure types. You have location-based adventures, and you've got event-based adventures. And a location-based adventure is going to be somewhere like in a dungeon or somewhere in the wilderness or some exotic locale. Event-based are going to be more like storytelling and moving from chapter to chapter but uh, for like roll 20 i prefer the location based only because you know it makes makes the game a lot easier to run otherwise you know it's just like a weird zoom meeting <laughs> um i don't mind it as much for like um uh um in person but like if you're moving a lot of different locations and you're moving fast and you're you know you're montaging things like uh, like that would you do with an event based and it's better to do it in person. Okay. So in a location based adventure, we've got our dungeon here. We've got our map. Um, we have to basically come up with a goal. So, and I'm going to do all this random so I can show you kind of like the process. I mean, I, I come up with a lot of my own stuff, but sometimes I just like to let the dice tell me what to do. And I've got a random dice roller and uh, on page 73, I've got dungeon goals I'm just going to roll d20. So I rolled a four and it says acquire a treasure. So right away, I'm, let's open up a document. And for those of you listen, thanks for listening. Hopefully I'm going to chop all this up into smaller bite-sized content so you all can, you know, go with it as you can. So when I start writing... So for those of you who are interested in in the writing side of what I do more than anything, um, I usually start in Google Docs. I don't I, I, with monsters. I'll do GM Binder, but I'll start with this, and we'll we'll call this New Dungeon Adventure for now. <clears throat> and then I'm going to put in some of my basic notes here. Uh, I'm going to give this a headline that way it pops up on the uh, side there, and I'm just going to write down all the things that I'm rolling. So Dungeon Goal find a treasure or acquire a treasure okay so that's the first step pretty simple right next we got to identify an important npc so that's on page 74 I rolled another d20 i got a seven undead with any agenda all right so we got an undead living here as our villain undead are always good I'm thinking a lich. I haven't done a, a good lunch adventure yet, so we'll say it's going to be a lich. Oh, it's supposed to be a fifth level adventure. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Maybe it's Flactory's there. Uh, adventure allies. So your ally is going to be potentially somebody that's in there that can help you out. 
Uh, let's roll a d12 for that. We've got an enthusiastic commoner. That's fun. Enthusiastic commoner. We'll figure out who that is later. Patron. Uh, typically, a patron should be the person who tells you to go. Uh, that's at least how I read it. I don't think they really clarify what the difference between a patron and um, um, the NPC. But, um, yeah, like, I'm just going to go say it's the person who's it's your quest giver a respected elder so a respected elder wants you to find a treasure in this place that's run by an undead and you've got an enthusiastic commoner uh, maybe the commoner is the person who gives you a little bit of notes flesh out the location details that would be the time when you would create the dungeon itself so we're gonna um we're gonna do that like next but we've already got the map and everything so that's gonna be the big part of it and then we're gonna Next is find the uh, the find an ideal introduction. So how does this adventure start? Um, I rolled a six. It says, "Oh, classic! A stranger approaches the characters in a tavern and urges them to go to the adventure location." All right, so classic stranger in the tavern. <laughs> adventure climax. Yeah, sometimes I'll roll with these, but you know, sometimes there's something neat. Um, climax, dungeon begins to collapse while the adventurers face the main villain, who attempts to escape in the chaos. So that's it. We just use the DMG to come up with the um, the basics of the adventure. Next, we're going to go back to Chapter 5, kind of like I mentioned earlier, and we're going to find out more about the history of our dungeon, and that's going to help us figure out really what's going on in this place. So, dungeon location. Uh, we know it's in the wilderness, but I'm going to roll anyways to see if we can come up with something. It's in a cliff face. Wow! Isn't that convenient? <laughs> dungeon in a cliff face. Just like the map says, it's like Tim knew. Uh, who created the dungeon? I rolled a 14. It's humans. So when you roll the humans, and this is on page, if you want to follow along, this is page 100. Um, you roll on the NPC alignment and class table. So D20, a 7, lawful neutral. Interesting. And their class was monks. Oh. So maybe it was a cloister of some sort. What was the dungeon purpose, though? Why did the monks build this crazy place? Um, it was a stronghold. So let's look back at our map. This is going to be a dungeon built by lawful neutral monks who used it as a stronghold. But what... Stronghold Dungeon provides a secure base of operations for villains and monsters. Um, but now it's being ruled by undead. So this used to be some sort of big monk temple, like a stronghold. It's pretty cool. Um, dungeon History. Creators destroyed by attacking raiders. So whoever they were... Uh... They were destroyed by attacking raiders. So, womp, womp, see you later. All right. So that's pretty much all the random tables. Um, I want this to be... The other thing we need to decide is it's going to be a fifth level adventure for uh, five characters, which is my Saturday group. Um, and then usually I would say like within that tier, it can be adjusted up or down. Um, there's a big difference between fourth and fifth level. So I wouldn't really say going below fourth without some serious modifications. But um, let's say it's, um, you know, three to seven characters of fifth to seventh level, I think is a nice little number. But when I'm building all my encounters, I'm going to build it based on five adventurers of um, fifth level. That'll let me know how tough to make certain encounters and things like that using the uh, charts. All right, so that is the basics. We've got the um, 
the the who, what, when, where of us of our dungeon. Got to find some sort of treasure in there. Um, probably should figure out what kind of treasure should be in there. Another thing to consider too is that the lich, um, probably where he we will want to put him. So we might have to put in the other maps for that. But at least we have the basic theme of what this first level is. Um, this is going to be the most obvious. This is going to be the most obvious entrance of the the whole stronghold. That's why it's got the traps and the portcullis and like all this. So if 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 a lich has moved into this place, chances are he's going to have it pretty protected. And I don't know if we should use lich. Maybe a, a vampire would be cool. You know, I haven't really done a vampire adventure. Let's do a vampire. Well, let me look. Let me um, let me take to uh, Facebook and see what people are saying. What do you guys think? Should I? Um, Bruce asked me if I do a lot of levels, but to ten. Well, yeah, I've got a few, and um, the 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 big thing is like most people don't play past ten. Um, if you look at the data that's been collected from stuff like uh, oh god, I forget who collected, maybe D and D Beyond. And uh, I think 538 like came up with some data too, of all things. 538 is so weird. Um, they, you'll see that most people play third level or start at third level and fifth level. Third and fifth level seems to be the the biggest ones. Um, now, Kobold Cauldron's eight, I think, uh, Scotsman. Uh, yeah, Clash of Kobold Cauldron is, is tier two, like higher level tier two. Ride, yeah, Ride Below, Drown are both higher level. They're also underwater. But, uh, and then looking at my roll 20 cells as well, like my lower level adventures do definitely do better than my high level stuff. So it, it really just comes to a supply and demand kind of thing. And I've kind of toyed with the idea, like eventually I'm going to make my own rule set for 5th edition um, based on some of the observations I've had. And uh, yeah, Where Crocodiles, I think, is 11th level. So I've got a few. They're just not as popular, um, just because a lot of people like don't get that well. And it, it's it's another reason too. If you to if you were to um, um, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, there's there really isn't a lot available for it. So Bruce asked. He wondered if it would be more players playing higher. There were more adventures available for it. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, right now. If you look at the list of adventures that WotC provides, almost all of them start at one in some form or another. They had they like you'll see that the common design elements are they'll start at one, but they really start at fifth. It's just they plug in like a, a first level adventure because first level is actually more difficult to run effectively without TPKing the party than a um um like a third level adventure. So a lot of the books like will start are built to start at fifth, but they'll throw in like adventures that they can do. So take like Strahd, for example, like if you don't start at like third or whatever, fifth, fifth level or whatever it's supposed to start at, they've got death house that you can run through and gain their requisite levels to get ready for the rest of Strahd. Uh, and the same with like Storm Kings. Uh, Mad Mage is probably the only book that goes past 15 currently. Even Avernus, I think, tops out at like 12 or 13. Um, it's just uh, Wizards did a lot of research over the last 20 years between 3rd, 4th, and 5th edition where they found like a lot of people abandoned playing the game at 10th level, which is why if when you see when you hit 11th level, the delta between 11 and 12 is pretty pretty small i mean it's like one game session one and a half game sessions to get to level 12 from 11 versus like the the slog it is to get through 10th through 11th because they wanted to kind of incentivize people to keep going in the game but even then like wizards just hasn't put out a lot of uh higher tier content it's also hard to write for there's like um when magic items start becoming more prevalent and like some of the powers that people get at 11th level and beyond it just gets really tough for a dm to kind of control what's happening um especially for those who don't have a ton of experience in it like even me i was running 11th through 12th <clears throat> excuse me 11th through 20th levels with my bloody bunch campaigns and it's just um 
it's just super hard. Like they can fight their way through, and if they got a high level wizard, good luck. Because guessing for every single thing that's going to happen, you you have to design the adventures, keeping in mind that it's going to be really tough to kill the characters. Not that that's the goal, but you know you still got to make challenges. Um, but like I don't know, it's just tough. <laughs> But, uh, uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, and oh, by the way, I, Bruce, I don't know if you, um, have, uh, Foundry just put it up on their thing. Um, I'll drop the link. I, I meant to drop the link, but Foundry VTT just made Kabold Cauldron as kind of like one of their official releases. Um, so if you use Foundry, you can play Kobold Cauldron on that. We did like a lot of new original art for it too, which is kind of cool. And I think, um, what's his name? Apropos, the guy who runs it, did a really good job of like bringing it in and stuff. It's really, it's really awesome. So check that out. Um, well, <clears throat> I'm doing fifth level because one, fifth level is popular. <clears throat> Two, my group's popular, or my group is, <laughs> they're popular. My group is fifth level, so I need to, um, <laughs> yeah, it'll happen. I mean, no, 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 I don't want to kill your whiz, Sarge. Um, but I, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, uh, make an adventure or make a, uh, adventure for fifth level characters only because it's what I got right now. Um, there's an undead baddie. Uh, I can create my own, but I like going SRD most of the time just because it's, you know, go with what people know. Make make life easier for Dungeon Masters. If you use, like, a whole bunch of, like, new stuff, it's going to be confusing. Um, you know, when you're you're used to certain conventions. I think a uh, vampire would be a lot of fun. I haven't really done a vampire adventure. Like, my own Strahd. We got this big, like, multi-level castle. Like, I think it's kind of a cool idea. And it's big enough that there can be other layers. Um, so, if we're going to make a vampire a bad guy... We have to have some certain considerations before we go into this. Um, namely, the vampire's um, regional effects and layer effects and stuff. So a vampire is going to have um, re all kinds of regional effects. There's going to be a noticeable increase in the population of bats, rats, and wolves. Plants within 500 feet of the layer are withered. So we've got all this forest out here that we should... Um, Remember, it's probably going to be like kind of funky looking. Uh, shadows act weird, and there's a creeping fog. So, real some some really cool like um, elements to keep in mind when doing this. Um, also, when you're dealing with a big bad guy like a vampire, you need to. Um, they're intelligent. They have intelligence of seventeen. This means they're not just going to be sitting in a lounge chair right in the middle place. Think about Strahd. If you've run Strahd or you've read Strahd, you know that Strahd's castle, Ravenloft, is like built. Or one would argue maybe all of Barovia is built to give him an advantage in any combat that he's going to be in. And he's a smart guy. He's going to always have a way out. So you, that's what you need to be considered of when you're um building out a dungeon so since we know that we want to do a vampire as the bbeg in this one i'm actually going to go and look at the other maps that i've got from tim i believe they're part of his 2019 collection no they were they were earlier this year um we're going to look at the other maps and try to figure out where our vampire is in relation to everything else I like the idea of him being in the dungeon. I think that would be kind of cool, but he could also be in some of the upper levels. But in my mind, a, a vampire is going to be protecting himself. Um, if you see my previous video, I started building out this back end layer, but we've got this too, um, which has a lot of cool stuff going on in here. So it's possible that he's going to be in here. Um, a quick look at the map, like you can see there looks like to be some sort of prison down south here. Um, here's like a cool secret chamber. So obviously that's something good for like where the vampire's hidden. Like he's not going to want to make his spot obvious. Here's another secret place, like easily a uh, coffin or something could go here. Even though we don't have, like Tim normally puts like a coffin. If there's one, like that would be a good place for it. And I know we're not even on this map yet, but it's good to think about this stuff while we're, we're planning like a major 
um, villain, like a vampire who's super smart. Like a 17, you got to think is like, like extra level genius um, um, because all stats are built on a curve, on a bell curve where 10.5 is like most of the populations could be a 10.5. And then like getting the 17 and 18 is like, 2% of the population is ever going to have that. And beyond that is like supernatural levels of intelligence at the far ends of the bell curve. So that's going to be a vampire, like one of the smartest people in the world. You're like dealing with like Stephen Hawking with fangs. <laughs> um, you know, it's like Bill Gates, it's gonna be Elon Musk type level intelligence. Um, so we found a couple sp cool spots there. Here is the, this looks like the topmost layer of the dungeon. This is kind of a cool area here. I mean, check, like, I imagine, like, maybe his um, followers are here and he can leap through this and fly off into a bat form. So that might be a cool place for him. Um, maybe even as a fake or even this spot over here, that's secret, see? So that's kind of cool. Um more secret rooms over here yeah this this whole like section is kind of secret um this could be fun i've never done a vampire layer before this is the map to do it to here's the middlemost layer uh not a lot of good secret spots here so i don't really see it there like in my mind i well maybe we got here this looks like some sort of temple i remember monks built this place and now a vampire is the boss so maybe they can go there um but that's a middle level you know we want to put it towards one of the far ends um here's our our the level that we're working on we've got some spaces we got this but i don't i don't know i'm not really feeling that so i'm feeling i really dig this room here you know he's got his like disciples there maybe he's not even in there himself maybe he's hidden here but his disciples are here and even then, he's got a pretty straight shot to get out and, like, fly off if he needs to. Uh, you got these, like, cool multi-tiered um, platforms here, which is really sweet. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, what do you guys think? The upper level or the um, uh, lower level? I'm going to go put this, drop my link back in. Oops, make sure that's the right link. Okay. Um Yeah, I think I'm gonna do I think I'm gonna do on the top level. I think that's kinda cool. Like that way Yeah, that that in my mind would be really rad, and here's why. Um this is such an obvious way to get in that it's gonna be super well defended. Like it would be murder trying to get through here and that's what I'm, I'm going to make it really tough like the obvious way should be like well guarded have all sorts of like minions waiting out there okay and then um the top level you got to get up to um you might find the secret area here but even then that's not like in his dungeon like where he's going to be he's going to be here and probably make it I kind of like in Ravenloft how he can have multiple places where he can be. So maybe we should do that the same thing too. He or she or, uh, you know, it, <laughs> uh, uh, they, whatever, whatever we want to make this vampire. Um, and then really the best way to get into this fortress without getting like totally trashed is going through the subterranean path. Like, yeah, it's longer, but you're you're gonna get killed if you try going in there. So you got to go in through these back tunnels here, and I think that's gonna be really cool. You've got a big abandoned section of the dungeon here that I was filming. This is what I was filming last week on another map. They've got to go on here, land here, get into the dungeon, find their way up to the first level. So you've got um, this. I think this staircase here and these pits lead up. Um. Where are the pits? Oh, this is the top most layer. So once you get up the stairs, you come in here. 
there's those pits. You've got these two spiral staircases, which are leading upstairs. You got to like power your way through all this mess. Or you got the staircase here, but maybe like create a reason. Like there's a MacGuffin like for finding him in there. Like I think in Strahd, you have to like get the sun sword or some crap. You, know, you get up to this top layer and you got to find a way to find him. I, I do I do think I'm going to go with like the whole like random thing. I mean, this is his lair. He's going to know when people are in and he's going to do everything he can probably to toy with them. But um, yeah, I really like the idea of maybe some other secret room being his um where his coffin's at. I think that's really, really lad. rad. Uh, was it upper level map with the platforms? Yeah, so so if you look at this dungeon, like that Tim's got, it's a five part dungeon that I've 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 licensed from him. It starts off with this first level here. So it's got this big, like fancy like facade carved into the mountain. Then you've got this second tier. So this is the middle level, and this is a balcony that overlooks it. So um, huge balcony too. I mean, you're these are ten foot square, so like over a hundred feet across. Then you've got this third level where it becomes a multi tiered balcony. So you got the the lower balcony from before, and you got this big open balcony, which is really cool. There's a, I think it's a portcullis there. Yeah, there's like a portcullis there and all that and like what's cool about this map series that tim made is that it didn't he didn't stop there like he put in a lower level so there's the pits from um there's our pits and then um there's this the stairs leading down that goes through sort of the back of this this temple and leads on through here which eventually goes off into, un into the Underdark or whatever you want to call it. Like, you've got two different routes. And Tim's maps are, like, really, like, paratime.ca. I mean, if you like big, chunky maps like me, like, I can easily take, like, I can easily take, like, the latest one he did and have, like, the path here eventually meet with that. Like, there's there's no ending to the amount of dungeons that you want to do. And I, that's what I really like about Tim's maps more than anything and I, why I think we have such a, a great working relationship. And he's easy to work with and his rates are reasonable. Um, I usually buy what already exists. I don't commission anything special for him. But you can see in here, like, there's Cortar. Like, if you've seen my adventures, uh, I bought licensing rights to this map which connects directly to this map. And it's the uh, Lost Altar of Kortar, which will appear in the compendium. You can also get it as an Electrum subscriber. Um, and yeah, like I just really dig the style. I think they're a lot of fun. And Mad Mage is all his maps. I've also bought some other ones that I haven't done anything with yet, but um, yeah, I'm a big fan. Big, 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 big fan. All right, so our vampire layer is what we're building. Um, I think printing provided players with enough XP obstacles to level. I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, yeah. They're they're really they're really hot maps. Like he has a lot of fun. Um, and he he sh now gets our relationships enough that he shows off like what he's working on. This one actually came as a suggestion. This actually connects to Quabus. So if you look right here, this is Quabus, uh, which I just released. Um, this is the first map of Quabus, second, third. I think I own the rights to this one. And then he created this one as a connector to this. Because I was like, hey, where does this go? He's like, uh, it goes down. I was like, oh, have you made that map? He's like, no, not yet, but I might do that next. So, like, Quabus literally connects to this map here. I just had to get off my butt and license the rest of them. If you want to license them before me and uh, make your own dungeon, go for it. I made four maps. That's enough. And then Blyer... Uh, Blyer Manor is like, uh, where is it? Ah, uh, there's Blyer Manor. So yeah, there's the, the original Blyer Manor. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Okay. So, so a little bit more complicated because we know this is going to be a vampire map. We know kind of the basics of where we want to put this guy. Um, uh, we, 
I, I'm going to go with the upper level. I or really, it's just going to be random. But I'll put his coffin up on the upper level. I think it's a little bit different than the the traditional lower. Um, really, he should have wait, multiple methods of escaping. So maybe we should do it. But for now, I think we have a rough idea of what we want to do here. Um, first chunk. Like maybe we have some guards out on the front, like watching. I think would probably be a good idea. Um, we've got the pit traps, the porculus, two pit traps, this main area here. So we would start building it out from there. Um, yeah. If you ever have any questions or, or you're not sure what to put into your dungeon rooms, especially when you're dealing with something like this where you've got 31 rooms and it's just can be intense. Um, if you go into the DMG, Appendix A has notes for random dungeons. And those notes are not just for, I mean, there's a lot just for drawing dungeons, which you can use, but on page 292, there's actually stuff for stocking a dungeon, and it gives you the chamber purpose. So remember, this is a stronghold, so we'd want to use the, like, if we were going to use nothing but random charts, we would use the strong dungeon stronghold table on 294 to figure out what's in there. Then we could figure out the chamber state on 295, so what kind of... um condition that the actual chamber is in when it's found remember it's ruined so it's going to be kind of old and then the contents itself which gives you um a number of options um which are kind of fun like you know basically the way that watsi has it is about there's always about a 50 percent chance they're going to run into a monster um beyond that there's like another 25 percent chance that there's some sort of trap in there or obstacle or hazard and then 77 percent and we're like from 77 to zero that's when you start having like empty rooms and uh, stuff like that so that's that's usually a pretty good number and especially if you want to design it mathematically so it works out perfectly and i'll show you exactly what that means okay so let's talk a little bit about the math of dungeon design um we kind of know what the chamber contents are going to be about 75 or 50 percent of every room is going to have a monster encounter so if we were to do this mathematically i'm going to open up a sheet <clears throat> in excel and this is if you really want to like and you can do it kind of just like throwing in whatever and, you know, God help you. But uh, vampire, uh, vampire dungeon. Let's say um, we'll, we'll have our, our rooms. Uh, we've got a total of how many areas do we have? We got 31 areas with some smaller sections, but let's just, just say 31 to make life simple. So 31 areas. Um, number of monsters. Uh, we'll say 50%. Factor. <clears throat> so. So that means 15 and a half rooms will have, um, a monster in them. Um, next thing is our daily adventuring XP. We want to say like each level is going to take a day. If you aren't familiar with daily adventuring XP, it's essentially the total number of ex encounter experience per character that they can gain or face off against per day in encounters before needing to take a long rest. And that means they totally drain their resources. And characters have multiple resources, the most common of which being hit points, um, but also things like spells, uh, magic potions, anything like that. Like that is what daily adventuring XP is a factor of. Okay, so daily adventuring XP for fifth level characters is gonna be, and I'm just gonna do this per character. So for a fifth level character, is um, 
3,500 experience per day. So this means that encounter per monster. Now, this is if you want them to spend one day clearing out a single level of the dungeon. You would divide the daily adventuring XP per character by the total number of encounters that you expect her to be on that level. So in this case, approximately 226 experience points per character per encounter. Um, let's see, uh, XP per monster per character, then XP per monster per party is gonna be that times five. So if you're still with me here, what I've done is I've taken the number of rooms, I've taken, I'm f saying that about 50% of the rooms will have monsters in them. So that means 15.5. Daily adventuring XP per character is 3,500. That's an average of 226 encounter XP per character. And then for the whole party, that's going to be 1,129 experience for a party of five. That roughly equals a, uh, that's going to equal a, um, like a CR4 want monster as one monster. So one CR4 monster against party five is going to use up some of that encounter experience. Um, or it could be, uh, like, I don't know, like, um, two, uh, CR2 monsters like would probably be that and so on and so forth. So this is giving me an idea of how much encounter XP, and that's not just uh, awarded XP, it's encounter XP to give per monster encounter to make this thing super balanced. Now you can go up and down from that number. That doesn't mean every encounter you should make. You should have some that are easier, some that are harder and so forth. But more or less, this is, um, where you want to be it's a little bit it, it pretty much means that <clears throat> almost every encounter is going to be uh pretty easy for the party they're all they're, they're going to fight like a cr4 is going to be relatively easy for them because a cr4 is 1100 experience divided by five is 220 if you look at the encounter difficulty xp per character chart on uh, i think it's on page 82 of the dmg uh, pretty, pretty, pretty sure. Yeah, page 82 of the DMG. Ha ha, I had to memorize. That's an easy encounter for them. But remember, they're going to be fighting 15 easy encounters like this. So it adds up. <laughs> and that'll be the experience needed to get through one level. Um, they probably won't level there, but after going through two levels, likely that they will we'll have a level up. Um... Okay, so back to our little spreadsheet. So this gives me a rough idea on what to build out with that. Everything else we'll build based on kind of what the, the tables and charts say. Um, so what I might do is I might end it here and then pick back up tomorrow when I start stocking this dungeon a little bit more. I'll probably go ahead and start building out the other layers as well so we can have all five in and we can all start making it all make sense for this one big colossal previously monk fortress that's now being used as a vampire lair plus whatever other factions and horrible things are within but anyways thanks everybody for listening hope this was informative um hopefully i'll get these all diced up into smaller videos so you can watch them on youtube and if you've got any questions or comments or anything you want to know about just uh let me know in discord anyways later